As we are being carried to the barracks, someone tells Apprentice Knight Chris to come out. Chris walks out of the tent and then looks at the man in front of him with a puzzled expression, asking who he is. The guy looks at Chris with a frown and then says that he is a disciple of Knight McCoy, let Chris follow him, he is called, Chris asked who is calling. McCoy glared directly at Chris, then said that a commoner like him dared to call him you, and Chris said that they were both apprentice knights, so let him take the heat out of it. McCoy went ahead saying that if it wasn't for the strict order of the person who called him, he would have torn Chris's throat out, Chris looked good and said well. Chris walked along the stone structures of perplexed, looking around, and then wondered what the Kremlin was doing here, who could have summoned it. In the room there was a table on which lay a huge variety of dishes. McCoy stopped at the door and glared at Chris, then told him to come in. Chris took a step toward the door, and then the Count's son appeared in front of him. Looking at him happily, he smiled and said that they had not seen each other for a long time. Chris replied that the apprentice knight Chris welcomes him. The Count's son was holding a glass of wine. He smiled and told Chris to sit down quickly, and then added that this wine was delivered from Haygrad. It is very sweet, it melts right on the top. Chris was also served wine. He wondered what the Count's son was wearing. He shivered, and then Chris frowned and said that he asked him to forgive him, but could he find out the reason why he was called? The Count's son drank the wine slowly, then he glared at Chris and told him not to be in such a hurry, and he called out to him in a friendly way. The Count's son, holding a glass of wine, continued to say that the hero after the battle, the owner of the man who ordered, and the brave one who was promoted from a commoner to a knight disciple, at first he could not admit all this, but thinking again, he realized that his stubbornness had closed his eyes. The Count's son looked at Chris carefully and then added to make Chris his man. The Count's son asked if he needed to be promoted tonight or if he wanted to get a peerage. He would listen to all his suggestions. If Chris continued his mouth, then he would give him a big hug. Chris looked at the Earl's son nervously and then wondered what the hell hugs he was crazy for. Chris replied that the Earl's son was going to promote him tonight and give him a peerage just like that, without any payment. The Count's son slowly ran his finger over the glass and then replied that Chris could pay the price of such a gift to him gradually. Chris thought that such ridiculous excuses will not work with him. He has everything written on his face what he wants. Chris replied thanks for the offer. Chris bowed with a smile and then said that he wanted to achieve everything on his own. He was grateful that the Count's son had invited him to the meal. The food and alcohol were excellent. The Earl's son glared at Chris, then asked that Chris didn't regret his decision. Chris, standing in front of the son of the Count, replied that he would not regret it. In his heart he had already decided everything for himself, so he asks for forgiveness. The son of the Count replied that Chris can go. Chris went out the door. Then the Count's son gritted his teeth and glared at the closed door. Chris was walking through the palace with his arms crossed. He furrowed his brows and said that he got goosebumps. The son of the Count had such an evil face as if he was rejected. We're being moved to the next day. Chris is standing behind Strick. Strick is looking at the paper asking what Chris has been doing lately. Chris is puzzled and asks what Strick means. Strick replies that he has errands to run for him, let him leave for Highgard in two days, and then they add that Chris is in deep shit. Chris looks at Strick with a puzzled expression. Chris is sitting on the bed reading some papers. Lynn comes up to him and asks what the security of the third Prince Circa is, what the brawler forgot here. Chris replies that they say it's to express gratitude for winning the last battle. Lin says that he once heard that the prince was once stung by a bee, and because his protector knight couldn't prevent it, the prince cut off his hand, isn't it true, he's out of trouble and crazy. Linda looks at the note in Chris's hand, puzzled, and then asks if it's a list of names of the Defender Corps members. Chris says yes, but their names aren't here. Lind exclaims happily yes, and then asks him what he shouted too loudly Chris glares at him. Chris walked through the forest thinking that he had two days to prepare, and he still needed to dig for information. He frowned and continued to think that although the third principal was a rather bad person, his mission was not that difficult, the Count's son might just have a grudge against him and therefore entrusted him with such a task. Chris comes to the tent, he is met by one of his soldiers holding a box in his hands, then asks what master, have you come? Chris doesn't answer about coming up to Fox and saying that he has something to ask. Fox turns around with a bruise on his face and asks what it is, Chris asks what's wrong with his face. Chris glares at Fox and then says that he told him how he would do everything, then let him bring it to him. Fox replied that he thought it would work this time. Chris hands over a roll of paper and then says that okay they're done, let them look at this list, if there's anything suspicious, let them tell him. Fox starts reading the paper and then says that McCoy is a knight and everyone else is a member of 100 man squads, he doesn't see any particular problems in this list. Chris looked at Fox carefully and then asked what if those who served on Vane's side, Fox replied that there were none. Chris thought, looking at Fox, that even though he was a rowdy boy, he was still a prince, the defenders were somehow too few, at least the list should have been made up of knights. Somehow everything is strange, as if, suddenly it dawned on Chris, and he kept thinking that they wanted something to happen among the defenders. 
Chris started telling Futch to dismiss everyone and send them to Highgard if there were any strange people among the non-natives there, let them find them. And in Dave let them do the same, Fox replies that there are a lot of people coming and going to these two cities, it will be impossible to check all the non-natives. Chris holds up a finger and then says that he will set the conditions, let him find those who have talent and skills that are higher than usual. And then Chris adds as he leaves that he should also bring some more wires and keldrops, Fox replies that he obeys. We are transferred to Tackwell, who, looking at Chris, asks what the third prince's security is, and later Chris, he did something wrong or something. Chris smiles, then says no. Chris stretches out his arms, and Tackwell looks at him and asks what Chris wanted to tell him. Chris tells him what to do if he meets an opponent who is stronger than him, and Tackwell tells him to get out of here. Chris looks in Tackwell's direction, puzzled, and then asks what if it doesn't work out. Tackwell asks what Chris is getting at. Chris asks if there's an ace up your sleeve. Tackwell replies that there is of course, and Chris begins to glow with happiness and say that he knew it. Tackwell goes on to say that the ace up his sleeve is hard training and daily conditioning. While Chris is upset to say that Ellis doesn't like boring and proper dads more, but interesting dads who can become a friend. Tackwell holds the spear out to Reese and says that what does Ellis have to do with it at all, let him take the spear, of course it won't be an ace up his sleeve, but he will tell him a few useful tricks anyway. Chris, smiling as he takes the spear in his hands, says that by the way, why did Tackwell also take the spear? He thought that it was in vain to talk about Ellis, Tackwell replies that everything is remembered faster in sparring. Looking at the formidable Tequila, he says that in two days he is leaving with the Corps of Defenders. He cannot get injured, Tequila replies that he understood, but Chris only began to pretend more. We are taken to Chris, who is sitting at the bar. He closes his eyes and thinks about something, and then he turns around and asks what the results are. The guy hands him a small piece of paper and then tells him that this information is from Highguard. The guy in the black hood stands behind Chris and then adds that of the high-class fighters in Highguard looked five times and in Dave four. Chris wonders if a smaller and smaller squad of ten is too small for a kidnap drama, but there's something else going on. Chris turned to Fox, then told him that he had something else to prepare. They take us into the woods, and someone shouts that why the f McCoy grabs his head and shouts furiously that why did they put this jerk in the lead instead of him, that he comes from a noble family, Chris sits, not far away, smiling as he pulls on his backpack. Chris turns to McCoy, then smiles and says that if he doesn't think it's fair, let him earn feats on the battlefield. McCoy glared at Chris, but didn't say anything. Chris, standing at the head of a small group, shouted that all the members of the Defender Corps were going to go to Highgard now. The soldiers marched in a steady line through the forest. One of them, looking at his comrade, said that the f***ing equipment in this weather, he was going to die from the stuffiness, another soldier threatened with his finger and told him to keep quiet, otherwise he would hear. Chris looked toward the bushes. Then he raised his hand and said, stop, and McCoy asked what it was. Chris carefully looked to the side and then said that he thought he saw a goblin. McCoy replied that Chris should not carry garbage. This is triangle territory. The soldier looked to the side and saw four green goblins with red angry eyes. McCoy looked ahead, startled, and then asked what the hell the monsters were doing here, and Chris asked what was important right now. The soldier ran forward with a spear to make everyone ready for an attack, they infiltrate the center and eliminate a group of goblins. A few minutes later, Chris was standing by the goblins' dead bodies. McCoy looked at them with a puzzled expression, and then asked, seriously, where did these guys come from, and so many of them. Chris wondered if that was true, if the triangle was somehow suspiciously connected to the three cities that were under the Count's control, and there was always a guard in this area that suggested the invasion of bandits and monsters. Chris glanced at his soldiers and then wondered what the situation was. Immediately on the first day of departure of the protection squad, strange things happen. Chris said that they make a small stop. Chris dropped the bag of rope on the ground. A pumpkin came up to Chris and barked, and Chris looked at it happily. And then stroking her muzzle, which was smeared with blood, told him that he was a good guy, suitable for the team, by the way, where the blood came from during the day. He managed to catch someone, Chris thought that this is the same guy, he hunted at night, or something, but it's clear he's a predator anyway. Chris, standing next to Pumpkin, who was waving her tail merrily, thought that they would start by putting the wire back in place. Chris returned to the camp, McCoy glared at him and asked what the so-called commander was doing. Where he had been for so long, Chris looked around and said that they were meeting princes, it seems that he was so nervous that he had diarrhea. McCoy waved his hand near the nose and then said that it was disgusting, Chris smiled and then said, everyone wake up, they are resuming their journey. The soldiers walked through the forest, looking back at the bushes. Chris carefully looked ahead and then shouted that again, everyone be ready and attack the goblins ahead, McCoy gave Chris a disappointed look and then asked again. Chris and the soldiers were finishing off the remaining goblins. McCoy glanced at Chris, then said that at this rate they wouldn't be able to reach Highgard by nightfall, and Chris said he was right. And then he looked to the side and said that they would spend the night here, 
and in the morning they would continue on their way and let everyone rest. McCoy looked at Chris with displeasure and then shouted what a heresy. Chris looked at McCoy with a smile and then said that he knew that he couldn't force the fighters who fought monsters in a life and death battle to go on a strict march. McCoy replied, in a life and death battle, yes, they are all dead if they arrive at the place later messengers. Chris smiled mischievously, and then laughed and said that it looked like something had come out of McCoy's head. Who was the head of the squad here? McCoy gritted his teeth in displeasure. Night fell. McCoy looked at the men and then asked what they were doing with their sleeping bags. The soldier looked at McCoy with a puzzled expression and then said that Commander Chris had ordered them to be taken to be ready to spend the night in the open. Chris, lying in his sleeping bag, said that he thought McCoy didn't know how the world worked, so he had to be prepared for everything in advance. Soldatov glanced at McCoy and then asked if he could get him a sleeping bag, but McCoy frowned and said he could manage. Chris, smiling in his sleeping bag, looked at McCoy and offered to join him. McCoy got mad at these words and menacingly replied that he would kill, they would definitely kill Chris someday. Morning came, Chris looked at the fighters and replied that everyone should get up, they should go faster and continue the road. McCoy standing behind Chris spat in the side and then said that they were f insects. Chris, standing next to McCoy, calmly replied that they were there. Chris was standing in front of the bridge leading to the castle. A soldier came out to meet Chris, they shook hands, and then the soldier said that he had heard a lot about Chris, by the way, they came later than planned. Something happened on the way here, Chris replied that they came across a group of goblins, so they had to stay a little longer. The soldier asked, puzzled, if the goblins were in triangle, Chris calmly replied that there weren't many of them, so he thought they were being chased. So they wandered here, the soldier sighed and said that he could see that they were alright and he was glad. Chris looked at the soldier and asked when the prince was coming, and the soldier said it would be very soon. And then, looking to the side, he saw a large carriage with a man in golden armor at the head, and the soldier said that it looked like they were here, and someone shouted make way for the prince. The carriage led by the golden armor knight drove up to Chris. Then he said that his name was Chris, and that he had received orders from Count Ludwig to lead the defense team. The prince started to descend from the carriage. Then he looked at Chris and told him to look up. It was a boy with a disgruntled face, wearing a brown shirt, and Chris wondered if he was younger than he thought. The boy, frowning, asked what Chris was staring at, wanted him to rip out his eyes for disrespecting his superiors. This boy is the third prince of Cirkiatic Circadogosh. Then the prince turned to Chris and said that since he was called the hero of the battlefield, he thought Chris was really good, but in fact nothing special, the prince shouted to Nelson that they were going. Chris was approached by a fat guy with red hair, he looked at Chris with displeasure and said that he was the responsible person of Highguard, San Zion. Chris replied that it was an honor to meet him. San looked at Chris and then said that they were getting ready so Chris could go right away, but since the preparations were finished, they could be on their way. Chris looked at him and wondered if he was telling them to take that bomb with them and get out of town. Chris held up a thumbs up and then said that from now on they were going to Dabed, the whole train. The prince's carriage set off, the soldiers walking around him. One of the soldiers looked away, puzzled. Behind him, the soldier's comrade whispered to him to negotiate, and the soldier asked him where he had left off. And then he looked at the road and said that well, after she buried her dead husband's crown, she returned to the house, but found her husband sitting in the living room, full of vigor and energy on his face. In the shade of the trees, someone's red eyes blinked, and the soldier continued to say that his wife saw him in this form and was so scared that she fell on the spot, the soldier's comrade answered, and what happened next? A ninja appeared from the bushes, and the soldier continued to say that everything turned out as it should. Suddenly, two ninjas flew out of the bushes and cut the soldiers' heads with katanas. The surviving soldier shouted that a surprise attack. Chris turned around, frowning and wondering what had started. Three ninjas came forward with katanas. The soldier shouted that the enemy also appeared in front of the ninja advancing on the soldiers, and Chris shouted that everyone should keep their fighting positions. The forces that are in the rear, let them protect the prince's carriage. The frontline forces must destroy the enemy that is in front of their eyes. Chris turned around, attacking the ninja. He was trying to finish off one of them, but another enemy was approaching from behind with a katana. Chris turned around, puzzled. Then, with incredible force, he slammed the side of the spear into the ninja's shoulder. The ninja, frightened, defended himself with his hand and thought that even the spear shaft was made of iron. Chris, swinging his spear, shouted so that McCoy wouldn't die. McCoy, defending himself with a spear, shouted so that Chris wouldn't screw up himself. Chris looked away. Standing in front of him was Nelson the attacking ninja. Chris reflected that there were more opponents than he expected. Even Lord Nelson had a hard time defending alone. Two ninjas were running towards Chris, and after looking at them, he thought that he needed to quickly deal with the enemy and continue on his way. The ninja frowned at Chris, who was thinking that he needed to use all his strength. Chris recalled a conversation with Tackwell, who had told him that with his spear skills, he would be able to master this technique perfectly. It was useful when fighting against a large number of opponents, it was said to be similar to a snake's tongue. 
Chris used his spear like a ribbon in his hands, it was incredibly flexible and glowing, it instantly hit the two ninjas. Chris lunged forward with his spear, and then someone shouted Prince. Chris looked away, startled. The ninja held his sword to the prince's throat, the prince shouted Nelson with tears in his eyes. Chris swung his spear, and then, just a second later, the spear struck the ninja, piercing him in the heart. The prince looked away in horror. He was very scared and twitched, and then screamed, another ninja was approaching him. Chris dropped to the ground, grabbing it in his hands. He remembered Tackwell saying that the next tactic in a state like jumping off a palm would help him land an attack that would shake his enemy completely. Chris dug his feet into the ground, and then realized that he needed to lower his stance, gather all his strength into his feet, which were pressing down on the ground. Then he pulled the trigger, and Chris jumped like lightning. He blew past the prince in the wind, then hit the ninja with a single blow, smashing him into a tree. The ninja tore the mask by coughing up blood, a technique called dash. Chris looked at the ninja who was holding his katana, and then the ninja slapped it on Chris' arm. Chris wondered if it was a good thing that only the skin grazed slightly. Chris hit the ninja with his elbow, and the dagger flew out of his hand. Chris turned to the prince and asked if he was alright, and the prince shouted in disgust that of course he wasn't. Lord Nelson suddenly shouted. Nelson, while killing the ninja, shouted like Chris speak. Chris grabbed the baffled prince and then shouted that they would meet in Daytona in the evening. The two ninjas were furiously running towards Chris, shouting that he thought he could escape. Chris threw a smoke bomb at his feet. Ninja puzzled turned around, in the smoke one of them wondered what he got from a smoke shell, his friend shouted that the hell he can't see anything. The ninja looked to the side and noticed something. He pointed a finger in the direction of Chris running off into the woods and shouted that he had followed him there. Chris ran through the woods at full speed, holding the prince in his arms. A pumpkin ran up to them, and the prince screamed in fright. Chris looked at the startled prince, and then said that it was alright, he was raising this wolf, the prince shouted that he wanted a wolf. And then the prince pointed back and shouted that the ninjas were almost upon them. Chris tried to stop the prince from twitching, because he couldn't see the road, he was begging in his head that the prince would shut up already, that the prince wouldn't worry. He looked away. He saw a goblin lying dead in the bushes not far away, and he wondered if they had come to this place where they were killing goblins. The ninja ran after Chris, one of them shouted that they would take a shortcut, they had to catch them. A smoke screen appeared in front of the ninja, one of them swore and asked what the smoke screen was again. The ninja ran forward, not noticing the taut fishing line, he shouted that they should quickly clear the path and go ahead. And then, at the same time, the two ninjas slammed their throats into the fishing line. The ninja looked fearfully at their dead comrades, who were covered in blood and said that the enemy had set traps. One of the ninjas cut the line, and then shouted that no one should lose their vigilance, and let them cut the rope. Suddenly, someone shouted, and the ninja looked to the side in a puzzled manner and shouted out what was there. The ninjas were sitting on the floor clutching their leg, keldrops were scattered around them, one of the ninjas shouted that there was a scattered keldrops. The ninja calmly said that this would not work, and then added that Diko, take the wounded and leave here, the ninja named Diko was indignant and replied that he could go. The head of the ninja glared at Diko, and then shouted that he should already use his brains for their intended purpose, if someone is captured from the wounded, they are all f Diko replied that he understood. And then the head ninja looked at Keldrops and shouted for the others to follow him. The ninja chief ran forward, his brow furrowed in a menacing frown, and then said, the more he thinks, the more absurd it seems, and what kind of knight carries a Keldropa in his pocket. Chris ran forward with the prince. He turned around and saw the ninjas behind him, and then wondered if they were pushy assholes, how many of them there were. Chris glanced at the pumpkin, then realized that the Keldrops and smoke traps had already run out. Suddenly pumpkin stopped. He turned to the ninja, and Kreesa looked at him with a puzzled expression. The ninja ran forward with their swords outstretched, and the ninja leader shouted, What is this thing? Destroy it. Suddenly, the gird opened its mouth, and flames emerged from it. He unleashed a fire of incredible power, destroying everything in his path. Chris and the prince looked at him with a puzzled expression, and then Chris asked what kind of creature he had been raising all this time. We are being rescheduled for the evening. Chris sits next to the prince and then says that they will rest here for a while, the prince points to the side in displeasure and then shouts that Chris is talking nonsense, they are being chased, they should leave soon. Cross holds up his hand, which is covered in blood, saying that if they continue on their way, how will he stop the bleeding? The prince looks at Chris in fright and then asks for blood and replies that it's fine. Chris looks at the prince, then asks if they happen to know how to get to Dave, and the prince grudgingly replies that how would he know, they should be on their way by now. And then the prince looks at Chris and wonders what if he dumps him now. Chris sits still and thinks about something, the prince thinks that he should hold on to Chris. And then the prince turns to Reese and asks if he can deliver him safely. Chris puts a hand on his chest. And then he stands up and proudly says that, of course, if the prince trusts him, then he will protect him even at the cost of his life. 
The prince looks at Chris with admiration and then says wow. Suddenly, two ninjas appear behind the prince, one of them shouting that here they are. The terrified prince grabs Chris' shoulder from behind him and says that he can stop them, let him say yes, Chris calmly replies so that the prince doesn't worry. The two ninjas were holding swords and looking at Chris. Chris, looking at them, thought that perhaps Pumpkin had taken out one of them, and only these two were left, so he needed to deal with them as quickly as possible. Chris adjusted his armor, and then said that he was a simple man, if he saw that he was going to lose, he would run away. The ninja chief looked at Chris in a puzzled manner, then asked what he was talking about. Chris threw his armor on the floor and then said that to rush at them while unarmed is utter nonsense, isn't it? He glared at the ninja, then said that for some reason he had a feeling that it would defeat them. The ninja took up a stance, and then the head shouted that it was because Chris was beaten back. Chris who came back from the ninja attack then said that he didn't get hit. Chris hit one of the ninjas in front of him with great force, and then it flew back a couple of meters. Chris glared at the head ninja, then, with great force, he punched him in the side. The two ninjas were sitting on the floor a few meters away from Chris, looking at him. The head ninja looked menacingly at Chris, holding his side, and shouted that they were retreating. Chris looked at the head with a calm gaze, one of the ninjas was walking towards him. The head thought that he was wrong about him. He had passed a quarter of a day in uniform and with the prince in his arms, so his strength should have left him a long time ago, so why such power and speed? The ninja chief coughed up blood, then thought that it was probably not for nothing that he was named heroes of the battlefield, they are not his equal. The ninja had looked at Chris, who was calmly adjusting his hands, and then thought that he was a monster. Chris stood calmly in front of the two ninjas. Behind him was the smiling prince. The ninjas looked at each other. Their eyes met. And then they took off in different directions. The pleased prince, looking at Chris, said that how dare they attempt on the life of a member of the royal family. Chris wondered what exactly it was, probably mercenaries hired by someone powerful, unpleasant, he would like to catch and interrogate them, but can't leave the prince alone. The prince came up to Chris and said that Chris was good, maybe even better than his defenders. Chrysel smiled and said that the prince was exaggerating. The prince said that Chris was moving so fast, he was amazed. Chris wondered what was most important in this case, that the enemy wanted to put the royal family in a bad light by kidnapping the prince. There is only one man capable of such a thing, the king's younger brother, who will be the instigator of a civil war in Cirque, which will happen in the near future Duke Bantarum rolled Grosh. A ninja kneeling on one knee in front of another who was sitting on a rock, who was sitting on a rock asked what, that is, it didn't work out, the ninja kneeling on one knee apologized to him. The man with the mustache, Rados Ben, the duke's warrior, appears before us, thinking that this is a failure. Furrowing his brows, he continues to think that they failed such an easy mission because of one knight's apprentice, the duke definitely won't pat them on the head. And then Ben says that he will do everything himself, let them prepare a weapon and a mask. Ben, clenching his fist, thinks that the enemy is smart and nimble, do not underestimate him, he will do his best. Chris, looking at the prince, tells him that he would like to tell him something. The prince asks him what else, just let them go faster. Chris says that, in truth, he is going to wait here for another night, and then go on the road. The disgruntled prince asks why. Chris closes his eyes and says that if he wants to know the truth or if he should lie for the sake of the prince's peace of mind, the prince angrily tells Chris not to beat around the bush, but to talk already. Chrysa turns around and says that the enemy accurately calculated the time and place of the prince's arrival, didn't the prince find it strange? The prince gave Chris a startled look, then asked what he was talking about. Chris thought for a moment, then replied that the enemy had attacked them as soon as the prince arrived. No one could know the time and place of arrival except for those who were familiar with the prince's route. When he looked at the prince and continued to say what would have happened if they had stayed in Highgard for a while, the prince started to think. And then he said that to him, Chris means that Count Ludwig is involved. Chris, lowering his head, replies that they mean it. Would he dare to think about it? Let the prince not doubt the sincerity of the count, who protects the border zones. The prince displeased asks what he wants to say then. Let him say it as it is. The prince continues to be angry, clenching his fists, and Chris replies that this is only his personal assumption. He is careful in words, since he does not have direct evidence. The prince replies that he is not going to punish someone who is not guilty, no matter whose name Chris says. Chris smiles and closes his eyes, wondering what the prince should do. Chris replies that there is someone who knew about all their plans and gave instructions, that is, a gang of bandits. The prince is dissatisfied with Chris and says that he is again a bastard. If he continues to pull the cat, the prince will tear out his tongue. Chris says it's Count Vian's eldest son, Ludwig. Prince tasks us looks at Chris then asks the eldest son. Chris replies that he knew about all the plans of the Defender Squad and was the one who sent him here. The prince looks at Chris and then asks if Chris wasn't sent because he's a top-notch fighter, and Chris replies that whatever the case, his skills are still not enough to protect the royal person. The prince thinks about it, 
and then looking at Chris replies that no, it's enough, and Chris has already demonstrated his skills, so the eldest son, he understood, he will keep his promise Chris can not worry. The prince stepped aside and crossed his arms, saying that it wouldn't make any difference if they stayed here for the night. Chris replied that he had told Lord Nelson that they would arrive in Daved in the evening to confuse the enemy. And then Chris continues to say that spending the night here will also help avoid sudden collisions. Let the prince agree, many people keep going to the fortress and few who stay overnight in the forest. The prince laughed. Then he looked down, his stomach rumbling. The prince turned to Chris, and Chris said that to begin with. Chris smiled and said they'd have something to eat. A small fire was burning. Next to him, the prince was lying in a sleeping bag, and behind him, Chris was sitting by the fire. Suddenly, the prince turned to Reese and said, thank you. Chris said that the prince was a good man, and the prince turned to Chris and said that he was the first person to say such a thing to him, but the others just shied away from him. Chris smiled and then said that they just didn't know what the prince was really like, they didn't know his kind and sympathetic nature. The prince laughed, then asked what kind of nonsense Chris was talking about. Suddenly Pumpkin came running out of the bushes, and Chris looked at him and told him that he had done a great job today. He patted him with a smile and said that when they got home, he would feed him something delicious. By the way, when he learned to do such things with fire, next time let him not do it without his command. Pumpkin barked, and Chris pointed a finger at her mouth and told her not to do that. The prince was sleeping soundly, and Chris had said that they would take turns keeping watch today. Chris was sitting under a tree with his arms crossed and his eyes closed. He reflected that he already had 49 throwing points. He remembered Taquilla and thought that he was sure that when there were 50 of them, something would definitely change. Taquilla's scores also depended on his skills, his reaction to 30 and 40 points was completely different. Chris, sitting with his eyes closed, thought that now he could take a little nap. Chris drifted off to sleep, dreaming of Taquil hitting him over the head with a club. Taquil looked at him and said that it would be difficult to learn in a day, while Chris rubbed his head and asked him if he could do it. Taquil held his sword and looked closely at Chris and said that, of course, he knew that the stick fight sucks, maybe they will switch to real balls, Chris replied that he had to go on the road tomorrow. Many desperate knights die in vain, he also wanted to meet with relatives, if not, then let him be careful, intuition will help protect against a blade thrown at random, but not a sword. Taquil struck Chris's arm with his sword and then said that the opponent's breath, his voice, the sound of the sword cutting through the air, let Chris try to feel it all. Taquil pointed his sword at Chris and then thought that he knew Chris had a talent. He told Chris not to block, but to dodge, because he doesn't know what weapon the enemy can use again. Chris sat on the ground looking tired and asked Taquila if they were done. Taquil reflected that despite his young age, his feelings are quite expressive, and his intuition is working, he would say that such a thing can only be obtained by dying once, just amazing. Taquil looked at Chris and said that this would be the last time, and Chris said that Taquil had promised. Chris felt something in the dream and at the same moment, it was as if his arm had been cut off. Chris jumped up. He was standing in front of Taquil. Then, puzzled, he asked what it was. Taquil looked at Chris and said that this is Salgi or killing energy, one of the skills that a true knight should have. This is a special energy that shows your readiness to kill the enemy, as Chris sees, he didn't even move. Taquil, looking at the frightened Chris, asked what Chris felt. Everyone feels this energy differently. In his case, you can see how the opponent's breathing changes. Chris grabbed his shoulder and said that he didn't understand. It just seemed to him that a sword appeared out of nowhere. Chris looked ahead, startled, and then heard Taquil say that Chris didn't have to understand everything at once. Understanding comes with practice. Chris woke up and shouted in fright for the prince to get up. The enemy was coming. Someone came out from behind a tree and looked at Chris and asked who he was, who could feel Saudi at this age. The prince said that he knew he had to be on the lookout, Chris thought it was a killer energy. He glanced at the ninja, and then wondered if his only weapon was a short sword, bad business, no way he could win. Chris looked at the ninja, short bolts of lightning coming from him, and wondered if it was the wise type. The ninja was standing in front of a terrified Chris. The pumpkin was growling at him, and Chris shouted at the pumpkin to stop. And then he added that she should go to protect the prince, and the prince just let him run in a straight line. The prince crossed his arms puzzled and asked why he did this. The enemy came alone, let Chris just get rid of him. Chris, frowning, turned to the prince and shouted that he was different from the ones they had met before. The prince gave Chris a startled look, then whispered okay. The ninja frowned menacingly and then said that if the prince ran away, he would tear off his legs. The prince fell to the ground in fright. Chris frowned, wondering if this was a failure, and turned to Chris. Chris looked around and then wondered if Wise really had something to do with this, what should he do? Suddenly, the ninja appeared at the very head of Chris swinging his sword at him. He asked how much Chris underestimates him, we'll look around. Chris glanced down at the sword, startled, and then realized that he couldn't dodge it. Gillen suddenly appeared. He blocked the ninja sword with his sword. Chris looked at Gillen, puzzled. The ninja was stunned by Gillen's sudden appearance. The ninja jumped out of the way. 
Gillen looked ahead, and then said that it turns out Chris might be afraid, too. Gillen looked away, and then, looking at the prince, he shouted that he welcomed the noble and wise Prince Serki, and he asked for his forgiveness, but that he had to greet him so tactlessly. Gillen, looking at the prince, shouted that he came from Dave to save him. He listens to Count Ludwig, his name is Gillen. Chris glanced to the side and saw a disgruntled guard, it was Fox. Gillen held out his hand and shouted for the guards not to interfere, but to protect the prince. Chris looked at the sword scabbard with a puzzled expression, and Gillen told him not to lose it, it was worth more than his life. Gillen, looking at the ninja, thought that it was understandable why Chris was embarrassed. This type, Gillen smiled at him and wondered what they were like. They both jumped from their seats. Gillen swings his sword with great force, and so did the ninja. They clashed in a duel, their speed unimaginably huge. Chris glared at the ninja angrily, throwing a huge array of punches. The guards standing nearby watched their duel in horror, one of them said that it was incredible, the other replied that Gillen strikes three times in a second. Chris, looking at this one, was startled to think that no, there were definitely more than ten of them, if not for training with Tackwill, he would not have been able to see them. A system message appeared in front of Chris, throwing skill 52, and he wondered what it was. Gillen pushed with great force with one sword, while the ninja defended with two, Chris wondered if it was Weiss. Gillen, looking into the eyes of the ninja, thought that he is stronger than him. Although he does not understand whether he is superior to him in speed, in a long battle he will be able to crush him. Suddenly, blood spurted from Gillen's shoulder, and then out of the leg, too. The ninja made a couple of swings of the blade in front of him. Gillen, glaring at the ninja, thought for a moment. The ninja made a big dash for Gillen, and Gillen thought it was a chance. The ninja swung his sword like lightning, glaring menacingly at Gillen. Gillen thrust his sword forward, blocking the attack, and there was an incredibly strong tension in the air. The ninja stared ahead in horror. Gillen frowned at the ninja. The ninjas began to crack. He was terrified, and then Gillen hit with great force in front of him, breaking the ninja swords completely. The ninja dumbfounded flew off wondering what his swords were. Gillen didn't miss the opportunity, and leaped forward with incredible strength, swinging his sword. The ninja adjusted his mask, thinking that even it was torn. He jumped away from Gillen and thought that he should retreat, his mission failed. Gillen, looking menacingly in the direction of the ninja, shouted for the guards to catch up with this guy. Later, Gillen was walking through the woods with Chris and the prince. Gillen put his sword away, laughed, and said that Gillen's weapon was worth more than his life. Gillen didn't react, and Chris's smile faded. The Count's eldest son appeared in front of them. He looked at Fox, who had the prince behind him and said that Prince thank god you are safe and sound, from now on, Ludwig's night squad will be responsible for protecting him. The prince looked in front of him, puzzled, and then asked, who else is this? The count's son bowed and said that let me introduce him, he is the eldest son of Count Ludwig, his name is Vahain Ludwig. The prince looked at him in surprise, then, with a smile, he asked what it meant. The earl's son went on to say that the carriage had already arrived, and Fox had passed by with the prince on his shoulders. The prince turned around with a smile and waved that they were still seeing each other Chris Squire. Chris bowed and said, yes, prince. He looked unfriendly at the count's son, then he smiled. The earl's son frowned and clenched his teeth. We are taken to a tent. Chris is lying on the bed with a pumpkin sitting next to him, and Chris smiles and says that no matter how you look at it, home is still the best place. Morning soon arrives. Chris wakes up to someone yelling at him to get out quickly. Chris wipes his face and then asks Mac what he's been doing since morning. Chris came out of the tent with his eyes closed and then said that McCoy knew that he was late. What he wanted, he didn't have enough of their friendship. Chris was handcuffed. He looked at them with a puzzled expression as McCoy started reading from a piece of paper. Chris, he's passing Count Ludwig's decree to arrest Chris as a suspect in the case. Chris gave a startled look at the handcuffs, and then McCoy continued to talk about the attack on the third prince. Chris puzzled and asked what. Chris is being led by several soldiers in handcuffs. He raises his hands, looks at his handcuffs, thinking to himself that he can't believe he's being cuffed. Then he looks ahead, thinking that, by the way, he was only guessing at the whole thing, but as it turns out, he was really going to throw all the responsibility at him. And his current position is just perfect for taking him away, which is what this jerk is up to again. Docky sees the commander being led by several soldiers, chained up in handcuffs, and he shouts at him, and Chris notices. Docky gets very angry looking at them and tells them why they are taking his commander away. After that, Digo is standing nearby and Lin stops the dog while he tries to come right up to them, saying that he should cool down. Chris smiles back at them and tells them he'll be back soon. While Lin stares seriously, stopping the dog and thinking, oh my gosh, what's up? Then they see Chris being led straight to one of the doors, and another disciple of the knight stands in front of him and says that there will be a trial in this place. Then he lowers his head and tells Chris that he's sorry, but he knows there's nothing he can do about it. Chris smiles as he looks at him and tells him that maybe he's worried about him and shouldn't go in there with his head held high. 
Then he goes to the door and one of the soldiers tells him to come in. As long as he thinks about what he wants, he says so, it's still hard on his heart. After which, he enters one of the rooms where many people are sitting everywhere, and in the center is the Count's son. Two men from different sides say that he finally appeared, and that's who it is. A lot of people are looking at Chris, looking at him. Chris also looks around the room and thinks to himself that he has come, watching the Count arrive, going in with another man, walking behind him. After that, the Count sits down at the table with a man, and it was the leader of the Knight Squad Stein. The graph suggests that let's then start by saying that we should fully explain the entire process of what happened, to which the Count's son smiles as Chris is brought to him, and he says that in the end, their night squad Ludwig saved three princes and completed the task. However, he suspected that something was wrong. After that, he raises his head up and says that the enemy simply could not get into the territory without being noticed. Based on this, he came to the conclusion that there was a traitor somewhere among them. Ho oh, and while Chris is looking at him seriously, he goes on to say that in the current situation, he conducted surveillance on Chris and discovered his actions. Too suspicious, having the status of a knight disciple, he usually stays in the barracks for some reason and often looks into the city. He continues to talk as Chris stands and looks at the count about how Chris has been seen with the city's rowdies and it has also been confirmed that he has recently been staying at the home of an unidentified man. And Chris thinks about how even his teacher was found out and wanted to hide everything. Chris starts to get indignant as he continues to say that this is why he believes that the squire is in cahoots with the assistants, that he is among them and planned the whole incident, and he threatened the honor and lives of a member of the royal family. Such a crime is worthy of execution. While Chris thinks about what a rotten person he is, Counties listens to this and turns to Chris, asking if he can reveal the identity of the man. After that, Chris thinks that he should only tell the truth, and looking at the Count, says that the mentioned man's name is Tekel, and he came from the center, demoralized from the royal guard. After that, the Count says that he knows him, and he can remove suspicion regarding this issue. And the Count's son, clearly displeased, turns to Chris and says that he is listening. Then one of the seated men with brown hair and a black mustache says, is there a reason Chris planned what happened? After which, this son of a baron smiles and says that, of course, there is, because he wanted to increase his reputation by saving the third prince. After all, Chris had already stated that Yero wanted to get promoted, and Chris stands with his head bowed, thinking to himself that he's sure he's made up all those lines and even prepared the phrases in case he has something to counterbalance. After that, everyone imagines that he is a puppet, while everyone is watching, laughing at him and controlling him. Do you think he miscalculated here? The truth doesn't matter, it's all a pre-planned graph. It is completely circumvented. Chris starts to look at all the people sitting there and the way they smile, thinking that maybe they can't execute him, since even Gillen is next to the count. We can conclude that the graph is not disposed of just like that, from skilled fighters. And he continues to think that, however, at best, he can be exiled somewhere and so become like a shadow, after which they begin to resent, saying that then all that he has achieved here can be considered simply in vain. At that moment, someone is knocking on the door, and Chris notices it while the soldiers outside are shouting that they can't go in there, and the man is shouting that he really doesn't know him. If they drop their hands right now, they'll f After that, the third prince opens the door with his foot while the soldiers are standing nearby and clearly unhappy, holds a piece of meat and continues to chew while one of the soldiers tells three prince Edic to enter. He notices this and looks at it along with the others, thinking that this guy is the third prince. And how long has it been looming? After which, Prince Three steps forward while Chris watches him and is embarrassed, telling Chris how desperate he looks. And he answers him that it is an honor for him to meet him again. And the prince throws his piece of meat on the table to one of the people. Speaking of which, there's even an uncle sitting here. So, uncle, hold the present. And the man to whom he threw the meat thanks him for a piece of meat. Then the prince continues to chew and looks at the count. She'll look him straight in the face, play along, and look down at him. After that, the prince continues to chew, approaches the count and asks him if he can attend the trial and if he has any problems. The count looks at him and says that there is no problem, and let him sit down. He sits down between the head of the knights and the counts, leaning his feet back on the table and sighing, while everyone around becomes uncomfortable with his presence. The prince then tells the count what to do while he closes his eyes, and he says Chris is innocent. Everyone around them is surprised, and so is the baron's son, while Chris stands and smiles at the prince. The Count closes his eyes and listens to the Baron's son telling his master that he must not be blinded by this man, and he just wants to get in his good graces. Then this prince looks at him with disdain and says that he is talking nonsense, and he will say again Chris is innocent of anything. He, in turn, is very surprised at this and tells the Lord Prince that this court is fair, and one knight is his majesty, the king. The prince is clearly displeased and starts shouting, saying that, really, his ears were blocked and, moreover, it was not him who was attacked, but the prince. And how dare you open your mouth now if you didn't know where you were staggering during the attack. 
and while the son of the Baron begins to get very angry, gritting his teeth. The prince keeps saying that Chris was the one who saved him, and now you're going to execute him or something. Whereupon this son of a baron says that the lord is a prince, however. The prince jumps up from the table, pointing his finger at him and shouting that they saw that his look was displeased just now, and let him with the knight tear out this cretin's eyes, because now he felt a threat to his life. And while the head of the knights is sitting next to him, turning a blind eye to the whole situation, the prince shouts to his friend about what he is currently doing, and he should immediately pull out his eyes, because he insulted a member of the royal family. After which, the prince's knight closes his eyes, clearly worried, and approaches the baron's son while he stands there in shock, saying that he is asking for it not to be done and wants to stop everything. He begins to worry as the knight draws his sword, talking about not getting any closer and stopping, starting to worry, his mouth hanging open in surprise. After that, he turns to the count and says father, while the one who has closed his eyes turns to Mr. Prince. And while the prince, clearly displeased, turns to the count and listens to him, the count continues to say that there was a misunderstanding. The count turns to him, while the prince asks in surprise what the misunderstanding is, and the latter tells him, they say that it is true, his son would never dare to harbor evil intentions towards them. The prince smiles, they say, really, and the count says that the lord prince is right, looking at Chris, saying that he is innocent. Then the prince slams his mug on the table. He starts laughing, talking about the video of whether he faces them at that moment. Chris and Dima sit at the table while the chicken is on the table and they eat a piece and there are drinks next to them. Chris says yes, it was very hard to hold back his laughter and the prince, holding a piece of chicken, looks at Chris and says that this idiot count only thinks of his children, doesn't he think it's mean? Chris smiles and says that yes, it's very mean. And while Chris lowered his head and smiled at the prince, the prince looks away and says what a pity, if things went a little further, then probably everyone would shit themselves from fear. Then he picks up a piece of chicken and starts laughing maliciously. They say that Chris will definitely continue what he said and how he got the warrant there. The prince then watches as Chris stands up and starts waving his arms. Lind is very surprised by Chris' movement. After which, as Chris goes down, the prince says that he knew his eyes were right, he wasn't fooled, and he's really incredible. While Chris says that he thanks for such high praise, and the prince looks at him and says, then let's get to the main topic now. Chris is surprised by this, raising his head and asking what he means. And the prince smiles and calls him to him, while he is very tense and looks at him, speaking of going to the royal capital with him. And Chris looks at him and calls him prince, while he smiles and points to his knight, who also smiles, saying that he also agrees. And Chris was very worried, looking at the prince and thinking that he really liked him so much. If he went to the capital now, the chance of achieving merit in the service would just disappear for a while. Thinking that what should he do, he doesn't want the prince's relationship with him to worsen. And Chris looks at the prince and tells him if he can tell him something, while the prince is surprised by it and tells him to talk. Chris gets down on one knee and puts a hand to his chest, thinking what a shame. He says that when he first entered the battlefield, there was a friend named Dran by his side. After that, the prince covered his lips with his hand, clearly standing and listening to Chris's story as he explained how he lost his legs and he died right in his arms. It's hard for him to leave this place. Chris smiles as he watches him wipe away his tears and tell him that he's got something in his eye. He stays at the table, pushes back his chair, and asks if he thinks gate 8 is a headache. The principal rubs the tears from its eyes, saying that it naturally believes that isn't it obvious. And Chris kneels down in front of him and says that if he gives him three years, then for his sake he will capture one strong point of the wolf's lair eight gates, and he will leave Circa. Fingers ask if it's true and if it's all for him. While he says that, of course. And the prince holds out the mug directly to Chris as he walks up to him and leans in, talking about how well he believes in him, and Chris thanks the prince for that. Chris smiles as the prince asks if he wants anything, because he wants to reward him with something within his means. Chris says what if it is. After which, the prince looked very surprised, clearly making a displeased face. They say that it's really serious and that's enough. Chris says that yes, this is quite enough. After that, he leaves the building, thinking to himself that thank god everything was resolved. He keeps walking and thinking about what, but now he has more things to do. He remembers fighting against ninjas and strong knights, thinking that he still remembers that day. Thinking about that, the enemy's reaction speed and movement were just on a different level. She would put her hand behind her neck, thinking what if Gillen hadn't shown up at that moment. If, in his current state, he once again meets the owners of Wise, someone takes it as if they're going to cut off their head, thinking that, most likely, he will lose his life. He continues to move forward, reasoning that he needs to become even stronger and as fast as possible. He gives a serious look and says that he must have the power of wise. After that, he goes to the tent, from which he can hear people saying that this is what we will do. If it's going to work, it'll be tonight. After that, 
Chris hears and is very surprised that they say that they need to kidnap the commander, while the other person says that they need to save him for what the hell kind of abduction. He looks inside and sees how people talk about keeping things quiet, and even if they announce a death sentence, they won't immediately execute him. With any luck, he might decide to send him somewhere else. Chris walks inside, clearly annoyed, talking about what the hell are they doing and what are they talking about. He sees how Doki Lind and Diggo reasoned. They were very surprised that the commander came looking directly at him. Then he enters the tent and the four of them stand together. After that, Chris talks about what and what is the rescue strategy. Weren't the three of them going to break through the Count's troops? And Lin Nutterkatter couldn't believe that such a smart guy would do such a stupid thing. After that, Lin Digoff points a finger at the dog, saying that this was his plan, agreeing with this while he worries and looks around. And Doki tells everyone, hands clenched into fists, that don't stop lying, and that's a lie. It's bad. Please apologize. While Lin Digo averts her face, very worried. And Chris starts laughing, looking at the three of them as they stare at him in surprise. Chris grabs his head and smiles as he stops shifting, saying that he feels like he bumped his head on something while guarding the mission. Chris thinks to himself, smiling, what is this feeling? He lifts his head up and silently thinks about how he won't be in a hurry. He looks at his allies, speaking of which, he's not alone. Chris then hugs Winter and the dog while Digo stands nearby, scratching his head with his hand. And Chris tells them that thanks bros, they made him feel better. Lind points a finger at Chris, and they say no, he's definitely out of his mind. Then, late in the evening, Chris says that yes, everything is fine with him and let's have a drink while he treats them at his own expense. Everyone was very happy about this, after which they were already in the inn. Chris is holding a mug of booze. They are all sitting with the table, holding mugs each while Ella sits under him. She looks at Chris in surprise, asking him why he was taken to court. And she asks in surprise, how did it end up? Chris looks at her saying that there was a misunderstanding and fortunately he was found not guilty. Ellis smiles, remembering her rapier, saying that, by the way, she has already decided on a weapon. Alice smiles, saying that yes, she decided to take the rapier, thinking it's a good option. And Doki, drinking a mug. As Alice looks at it, she says that this sword is too thin for her build, so it won't suit her. And she is clearly dissatisfied, asks him, because he got drunk again and starts showing off. Ellis goes straight to the dog and clearly angry, saying that he will not interrupt her anymore and is good, pulls up a chatter. While Doki looks at her and tells her that he's never lost. Then Chris looks at Lind, and Lind says with a smile that's great, then he'll be the judge. And Chris says that Lind is a mess, too. He watches as Lind raises her hand and Doki and Ellis are already downing a lot of mucks. And while Lind says that the first person to fall on Digo's table, coming from far away, will pass, she raises her hand and asks for more glasses, please. After that, they grab the front door with their hand. And while Doki sleeps on the table and Chris watches him, Lind points a finger at Ellis as she comes out. They say that she is the winner, while she rubs the drool from her face with her hand and says that it was nothing to cock. It's already afternoon. The teacher says that they are progressing at this rate. He looks at the sky, they say that he is working out the missed training sessions. He stands and watches as the whole group runs around. They say that the one who comes last will get an extra portion. He watches as Doki runs, clearly tired, while Ellis smiles and asks why this guy is already falling off his feet today. Three months later, Chris, his dog, and others are sitting next to each other in the bathroom. Chris closes his eyes and remembers his past, sitting on one of the logs with one hand. I will tell him that there are usually nine stages, and he is surprised to ask about these nine stages. His teacher says that since Wise has been used for quite some time, people have been able to learn a lot about it by telling it to Chris. And Chris replies that it makes sense, and then they sit on the logs, and his teacher looks at Chris, putting their weapons to the log. They say that whether he knows that the method of practice is not one. Chris says that yes, he knows the basic method and two of those that appeared in the Descendants. Recalls all this in the form of a tower that has levels 1 through 9. Speaking of which is true. Among them, the Tower 9 method was the first to be studied. And the scientists divided the users of Wise into stages. He holds up one finger and says that if the child learns stage 1, he will be able to match the strength of an adult. And yet he will not be able to reach it yet. Chris asks, surprised, why what? And all because he's left-handed. As Chris stands up, I'm clearly worried about what they're telling me, they're saying that I'm too old to start learning wise. No, forget your age. He means that you need to have a special structure of the body. After that, Chris wakes up, sitting in the bathroom with his head thrown back. Speaking of which, the main point of learning is the accumulation of mana that hovers in the atmosphere. He looks at his hand and says that, in other words. After that, Chris notices a blue mana on his hand. The point is that he has to feel the mana in his body. I smile and shout that he did it. Clenching his hand into a fist while Lind, who is sitting next to him, asks in surprise, what is he talking about? After which, one of the soldiers approaches Chris while he is paying attention to him. 
they say that Mr. Chris is looking for you from Central Shed. Chris thinks to himself that the prince sent him, and just in time. Chris then sees the man bow to him and tell him that he almost lost his life several times on the way here, and that his name was Million and he came from Central Shed. Then Creesa holds out her hand to him. They say he's happy to meet her, and he's Chris Squire. They ask him where the book is, going down to him. And a million already bald, starts scratching his head, worried. He says that, unfortunately, this book is not allowed to be exported, so he could not take it with him. Chris is very surprised by this, telling him that. And he smiles as he looks at Chris, saying that's why he came in person. Chris asks him what he means by that. And he puts his hand to his heart. It is said that he studied Tower 9 and shot arrows for more than 10 years, and he can let him introduce himself again. His name is Million, and he is the central chief scientist, exploring Wise's practice methods. Chris enters the tent and watches as Million follows him and takes in the entire tent from the inside. He looks at him, taking in the fact that he's wearing glasses, and he thinks to himself that he must have heard that name somewhere. Then Chris turns to him and he asks him. By the way, he is surprised. There aren't many people left who are interested in basic training methods. And Chris smiles, laughs and says that he believes that everything should be just that. To which a million smiles, bringing his hands together and says that yes, in order to make a good sword, you need to use high quality iron. Then Chris thinks, looking at him, that wait a minute while he keeps talking about how the blade won't break if it was forged without mistakes. Million looks at Chris and goes on to say that you should always start with the basics and the basics, which will help you train more effectively. Chris looks at it and says that the method with which you can learn the origins, to which he smiles and says it's his favorite expression, and it's amazing. The mission continues to examine while he smiles, thinking that he has remembered this person. He recalls how in that life, he held up the book, saying that he had finally found the basic method of training wise energy. After that, while his teacher is standing next to him and letting go of his head, Chris reads the book in surprise and says that is it really true, what is due to the fact that in adulthood it is impossible to remove accumulated slags from the body, you won't be able to study it, to which he is told that as he said. After that, Chris starts to get nasty and start crying. They say that why did he find out about this only now? They ask him to hand over the book. At this point, he notices that this book was written by the basic method of energy training author Sicko. Chris looks ahead and smiles while on the other side. They say it's a vacation and a good thing, since that person was sent by the third prince himself, there was nothing he could do. And the head of the camp, clearly dissatisfied, asks that there are no problems with the medicinal warehouse. Chris says that there are no problems and cannot worry. After which, in the tavern, he approaches his teacher, and he says that it is really possible, and he says that yes, it is possible. He gets his hand behind his beard and thinks that this is why not only he, but also those three showed simply unimaginable abilities to recover. To which Chris says that it is true that this is due to the healing poison that everyone took to comprehend wise. He keeps looking at his mentor and says that if he gives permission, then he wants him and Ellis to study at Vezo. They both hear someone else yell that they want this, but they don't both turn around and see Ellis standing in the aisle. Meshel smiles at her, she's a mentor, calls her name, clearly angry. Ellis looks at them at the entrance and says that she also wants her to stop and achieve a lot, wanting to get even stronger, to which Chris smiles. The mentor closes his eyes and says that okay, first he should arrange a test, to which he says that he understood him. Chris sits in his tent and meditates everywhere, surrounded by blue mana. He concentrates it, more and more appear, and then he remembers the words of a million. He shows two fingers by stretching them out and says that being able to sense mana doesn't mean he can use it, and he will master it after going through two stages. 1. Print 2. Open. A million remembers, telling what? Match three fingers with mana and in order to create a seal, you first need to be able to use the mana that is around you. And after he can draw a circle of mana or combine the separated mana into one. Million shows his hand, squeezing it into a fist and draws mana with his finger, showing a seal in the form of three sticks and a circle. It is said that a sign of the energy training method will appear in one of the parts of his body, and this will be the seal. Chris tries to do this by connecting two fingers, very worried. He brings those fingers closer and closer, and a sound comes out, after which, the mana on his fingers breaks. Chris smiles and says, clearly worried, that he knew it wouldn't be easy. Four weeks later on a bright day, Lynn stands sweating with Digo. Apparently, both sides say that Chris has been studying for a long time, to which Digo replies that yes, almost a month has passed. Doki comes up to them and Lynn looks at them and says that maybe he can't feel mana, because Chris asked me to tell him if I can. Digo looks down at his hand and says no, not yet. Doki looks at them in surprise, while Lynn closes his eyes and says what, what is mana and is it something edible? The Count sniffs the canvas. He puts it down and looks at it. He notices the blood on it. Then Gillen comes up to him and, looking at the Count, asks if he is alright. He asks what happened to his son, to which Gillen replies that he heard that he returned from a mission in Highgard, 
whereupon the Count brings the cloth back to him and closes his eyes. He thinks to himself that things are bad and it's time to choose a successor. He remembers his one son and says that he is hesitant not to be slutty, looking at the way he drinks wine and smiles. He is remembered by his two sons, who are at the canvas. It is said that after he went to the royal capital to study, he is only interested in painting. Then he looks directly at Gillen, who is thinking to himself, and he thinks about what if he was with his mother. The Count then turns to Gillen, calling his name as he calls out. And while Gillen is looking at him, he tells him to take the Knight's Oath of Allegiance. Gillen is surprised, and the Countess turns to him and says that he needs you, and will he be able to do it? Gillen is very surprised, looking at the Count and says yes. After that, while Gillen stands over the Count's bed, he tells me that my father arrived as soon as he heard about your condition. It was one son who, upon entering the room, yells at Gillenek, saying that he forgot here and he should get out. The Count turns just as Gillen is leaving and tells him to keep his promise. Then a soldier runs into the room and shouts to everyone that they are in trouble. Everyone was immediately surprised by this as they looked at this soldier. Then near the tents in the afternoon, Chris trains with Mana and by lifting his finger, he creates a circle from this Mana, thinking that now he can draw a circle. After that, he worries and thinks to himself that the next step seal keeps looking at him. He remembers the words of a million that tell about the seal in the form of a lock or in the form of an arrow. He says that during the printing stage, depending on the drawing, they will be able to get different features. And the advantage of Tower 9 is stability, because there is still a slightly easier method of shooting, and with it you can quickly comprehend the whys. Chris looks at her and asks in surprise if it's possible to combine both methods, to which he was very surprised by Chris's words and with two fingers, raising his glasses, says that how to combine it. This is the first time he's heard of it, and at least it's never happened in his memory. After that, Chris takes off his shoes, thinking that in his previous life he discovered a large number of ways that stem from the basic energy training method. And this suggests that there is still a lot that has not been studied in terms of power. After that, Chris tries to connect his fingers, using mana while breathing heavily. He thinks that since no one has done this, he is taking a big risk. Then he thinks to himself that if he doesn't take the risk, it won't work. He pulls away and looks at his bare legs, thinking that he will try to combine the two drawings, and even if he fails, the effort will not be in vain. He's trying to stamp it right on his leg, thinking it's very hot. A lock seal appears on the leg. He thinks to himself that his body is still burning up and draining mana. After that, he sees a system notification about the transfer behind his back that the level of possession of Wise is 10. And Chris is surprised to rejoice at this clenching his fist and saying that he did it. He goes outside and tells everyone what he could while his teacher thinks about it. He looks at Chris, notices how much aura has appeared around him. It is said that it cleanses, it emits exactly the same energy as from other wisers. After that, they hear someone on a horse approaching. Chris turns around, surprised by this. And the mentor, looking there, also says what the soldier is doing here. Chris says it looks like a messenger. This soldier runs right up to Chris and stops pulling his horse. He shouts to Chris's master that the order has been given to gather all the troops. This appears while the mentor is standing behind him, and the soldier says that the enemy has invaded the gate. He then runs away, saying that this is a war, while Chris looks around in surprise, standing next to the mentor. They stand and discuss what is happening with this soldier, while Ellis approaches them and Chris says that he understood, he will immediately return to the squad, and he must retreat first. To which the soldier says that he obeys and runs away, while Ellis comes up to them and tells them to take her too. The mentor looks at her, clearly displeased. Chris closes his eyes, saying that he respects her zeal, but now can't appoint her to any of the formation. While Ellis is gritting her teeth, clearly angry, and looks at Chris. Then he starts to leave, and Ellis looks at the box while Chris tells her that it contains herbs for cleansing the body, and while she's here, she has to use them once a day, saying that he's gone. The mentor watches his back as he runs away and shouts good luck in the battles. Chris thinks to himself, keep running that the invasion happened much sooner than he thought, and everything is going wrong. He runs straight through the city and tosses a copper coin to one of the beggars. Is this man looking up at her, and thinking about the fact that this coin is cut off from the edge? After that, this beggar starts running, thinking that there is an emergency situation and the entire train should prepare to leave. After that, Chris and Dima go out wearing their uniforms. There are many other soldiers walking beside them. Chris asks Dima what the situation is like as he turns to look at him. And while Chris is looking around, Lin says there's been an invasion, the enemy is coming much faster than before. Then Chris thinks about what they used, a bag of powder and a horse. Thinking that I know this, and since everything happened so quickly, they probably took advantage of these two things. He calls a pumpkin to him and puts a tag on it. He thinks that it is impossible to stall for time. He tells her if she remembers the tent where they found it, and she needs to pass it over there. Chris then tells her that he has heard that the fight has already been fought, 
and Lind, looking at Chris, says that yes, because of him, the situation has worsened. After which, Lind talks about what several men are doing. It was destroyed three times this row and 100 people. And while a soldier on a horse ran and cut the heads of two men along with the horses. Speaking of which, the two fighters who were among them went to the front line and died from a single attack by an eight-gate knight. This soldier enters the tent, while they say to him that here is our hero. This cat is a neutered man with a scar on his face. He comes in and stands at the table right for about three people. They say that the first three units of the enemy are defeated. After which, a man in the opposite direction with a black beard claps at him and says, is expected of a high-class knight, and they have high hopes for him. Dallas the man looks at him and says that he is ready to start performing one operation. He looks directly at the map, has green eyes and long gray hair. He says that the area where the agraph is in possession is unshakable, but the rest of the territory is weak, and they must attack all the villages in sight, collect the refugees and send them to the fortress. He closes one of his eyes and tells them to burn every village to the ground, which is the name of Operation Rampant Slaughter. After that, Chris with other soldiers dig and Dima stand in the line, thinking that they are in place. A huge number of soldiers lined up near the wall, thinking that it was an iron wall that hid even the canal behind it. Sunset hide. Daki looks at her and is very surprised, while Chris also looks at her. He says is she really so healthy while Chris is thinking to himself that he still can't believe it. He looks at this huge wall and thinks about how it is really possible to break the majestic fortress wall into so many pieces. But now everything is different, and this time we will show all our rage. After that, one of the soldiers enters the formation, shouts for everyone to gather, and the parade begins. After that, the Count himself comes out on the platform, dressed in armor. Chris is surprised by this and thinks, well, well. He looks at the majestic Count in his armor, wondering where he is about to die. After that, the Count shouts to everyone that they are at the fortress wall, which has kept our peace for three generations. He approaches and continues to say that now to this impregnable stage, which has not been able to break through even once approaching the vile and minions of the Eight Gate. After that, he said that we will do without long speeches. He becomes visibly angry and says with a serious face that let's wipe the enemy to powder. Then a lot of enemy troops on their horses run straight into the village. They shout that they can see the village, speaking of what's great and you need to burn everything here. After that, the soldiers enter this village and start walking around it, thinking that we will end this. And then one of the soldiers approaches the general, while he pays attention to him and says that they are in big trouble. He says that the well was destroyed, and it is filled with earth. Then they all look into it and notice it. The general holds the bag up to his face and thinks about how they won't be able to use the meat powder that way. And if they had drinking water, they would have solved the food problem and would have been able to continue advancing at a fast pace without a supply squad. After that, soldiers come up to them, saying that they were looking for, but did not find any people or food here. After that, the general gets very angry and stomps on the ground. He examines them all and tells them to leave now and head to the next village. To which the soldiers agree, and they again run on horseback looking for the village. And they notice, just like other things, their army is running towards them. They wonder why they're coming here, and no, it can't be that. The generals approach each other and look, say that the village in this area is also devastated, and he starts to get angry. The general thinks to himself, looking ahead, that the enemy has discovered their plans and no, it's impossible. And even so, how can the inhabitants abandon their land so easily? After that, the general informs them that he has contacted the main forces, and they say that there are two indestructible wells left, and they have no other choice but to go there. Already in the evening, Digo helps create the seal, they say that the mana has started to manifest and they don't have much time. Digo says it's pretty hot, and Chris tells him to be patient a little longer. After that, a system notification arrives behind Chris' back, and when he gets to his feet while many of them are sitting and helps them develop the seal, he says that now, if possible, they should practice with mana. Continuing to develop the print, Lin says it's harder than he thought while lifting his leg, and Chris sees Pumpkin come running out of the bushes. One of the men, dressed in a hoodie, comes up with her and says that they are done with the work that they were assigned, and in order to convince the villagers, they had to spend all the gold that they earned from a clean dream. Chris says it's nothing the money comes and goes. This man says that, as he said, they also left two wells untouched. Chris smiles at this and says it's great. Now the enemy will gather right next to them. After that, he thinks about the fact that so the preparation is complete and it's time to get down to business. He goes straight to the tent where one of the soldiers is standing. Chris approaches him and tells him that he has something to say to the Count, while the Count is clearly outraged that some knight disciple is being so impudent. And with the tent, he hears to be let in. Chris walks in and sees the Earl sitting at the table. Around him are knights and commanders, along with his son. He sits down on one knee and greets the Count. The Count looks at him and tells him to say what he wanted. Chris looks at him and tells him that if he grants him the right to personally lead a hundred cavalrymen, 
he will deal with the enemies who dealt with them with scouting parties. And then one son starts to get indignant, shouting at him and saying that here he is impudent, he goes beyond all boundaries and how dare he ask for such a thing and his three prince is not here. Whereupon one of the knights behind him tells him not to interfere and the man clenches his teeth and falls silent. The count looks at him and says that what self-confidence and good, but if he does not cope, he risks losing his head. Does he have any objections? Chris says he has no objections, keeping his head down. Then he leaves and the count looks after him. One son comes up to him and says that his father is a commander, why did he put so much responsibility on him? The count looks at him and says that by his actions he attracts the attention of the entire army and they say that the sacristy is straight into battle. Woof says that if he does the job, of course, it will be fine, and if not, it will not affect their strength slightly. Chris' wife, who leaves, is told that what his excitement is worth, after which Chris smiles and says that he will win at any cost. Chris rode down the road with Lind and the soldiers. Chris looked at Lind with a smile and then asked him what he already knew how to ride a horse. Lind replied that he had taken riding lessons, but was still far from a pro. Chris looked to the side and then said that all the troops should temporarily stop and wait here. Chris got off his horse, the soldier looked at him and asked if they could be trusted and what kind of axes they were, and another soldier said that there were various rumors, they also carried a dog with them, muddy types. Chris walked to the edge of the cliff and looked at the map, Linda looked around, and thought that if they went straight ahead, they would come out to the shore, he was sure that their opponents would be there. Chris put a hand to his chin and then wondered what he would do if he were the enemy commander. He thought the best thing to do would be to think about traps, divide the army into parts and go on a reconnaissance mission. Suddenly, Lind looked ahead and said what he saw. They were on a hill and watching the enemy army move down below. Lind replied that as Chris had said, all on red-maned horses, about 200 men. Chris replied that they were going well. Chris turned around and someone asked him if Chris knew the way. The man with the thick beard said that several hundred men from other squads had already died, but they still suggested moving forward. Chris thought, looking at them, that not the squad, but all bumpkins, do not listen to shit. The soldier looked at the menacing Chris and Linda and went on to say that by the way, he also noticed that they weren't even looking at a military map, and they were relying on what they had in their hands. Chris reflected that he actually made it while collecting medicinal herbs with Murdoch's gang, not at all. Understands the value of a map that allows you to learn everything about the surrounding area. Chris, closing his eyes, walked past the soldier, then said that it was enough to interfere, by order of the first order they are his subordinates, he cannot stand disobedience. Another soldier came up and told him to stop, he was sure that the commander was doing this for a reason. Chris thought that it turns out that there are several people in this squad who are cooking a pot. Lind looked at Chris with a smile, and then said that our commander probably has a hard time, Chris smiled and replied that there are advantages everywhere. Chris stepped forward, the ground beneath his feet began to get dusty, and he asked what it was. He looked ahead with a puzzled expression, and a system message appeared in front of his face, indicating that Wise's proficiency level was 21. He was startled to think that something in him had changed. A blue aura appeared near his hands, and he wondered what he could hear and see so clearly. He clenched his blue rippling fist and wondered what the discovery was. Chris and a small group were walking along the canyon. And then Chris stopped and looked at his warriors, and then told all the troops to prepare for battle here. The warrior looked at Chris and then asked what is here, Chris, how does he know about this? Chris glared at the fighter and then said that they will take over the rear, if there is a problem, they will rush to them. I looked at Lind and said that he was acting on a strategy, Lind said that he understood. Chris rode off on a horse with Digo and Daki, and Digo asked what he was sure Chris would do, that everything would be alright, what they would do if there was no one in the rear. Chris, rushing forward, replied that if the enemy had finished scouting this place, there was a high probability that they would plan a diversion with only one escape route. If there was no one in the rear, they would just immediately go to the front line, and for now let them trust the others. Digo looked at Chris, and Chris said that the most important thing now is to gain confidence in winning. Daki and Digo looked at Chris in a puzzled way, Chris said that Digo, by the way, was kind of lost. After training with Tequila, they continued to train, Digo said yes, and then asked that something was wrong. Chris told Digo not to worry, he promised. Chris on horseback said they would never die. We are transferred to the enemy camp, the fighter sits on a stump and says that no matter how much he eats this meat powder, he still can't get used to it, his friend replies that he should be happy that at least there is some food. Suddenly, the horses began to scurry and the warrior asked, puzzled, what was wrong with these mares again? Sitting on a tree stump, he said with displeasure that even though they were faster than ordinary horses, it was a complete hassle to mess with them. Suddenly, the fighter looked around, puzzled. He saw a pumpkin coming up to the horses and scaring them with flames from its mouth, and he asked what else it was. The soldier ran into the tent and shouted to the commander, the commander jumped out of bed and asked what was wrong. The fighter, standing in front of the commander, shouted that a wolf had appeared outside because of him, the horses were not themselves, the commander replied that he did not know what the problem was, 
just let them catch this hat. The fighter replied that the wolf breathes fire, the commander puzzled asked what. The pumpkin was standing in the middle of the fighters, breathing fire in all directions. The soldiers were scared away from it, the commander shouted that the fuck, and really fire? What kind of creature is this? The fighter, standing next to his frightened commander, asked what he needed to report to the top. The commander replied that if the fighter was afraid of heresy, he was afraid of a dog, let them form two detachments of ten people each and follow him. The dog jumped to the side, and the enemy soldiers said that the dog was running away, you can't miss it, catch up and kill it. Soldiers on horseback were riding through the forest, and one of them turned around and asked what it was. They saw Chris's troops from the cliff, and one of them said the century, they were Cretans, was the only escape route. The fighter with a crazy smile said that everyone should forget about the wolf, and gather everyone, and not tear the enemy to pieces. Chris's warriors stared ahead in fear. Enemy soldiers appeared on horseback ahead, and Chris's warriors shouted that the enemy was coming and that everyone was ready to attack. The soldier, looking ahead, said that the enemy army was directly ahead. Chris and Digo were walking through the bushes, then Chris said they were here. Digo asked that there were about 20 people, they would definitely defeat the three of them. Digo smiled when Chris told him to have faith in him and hit with the axe with all his might, since he had the most powerful hands of the three of them. Enemy warriors on horseback were running forward to the rear of Chris's army, and one of them shouted that the enemy was ahead. The soldier on horseback finally said that they were complete idiots, they could be dealt with like two fingers on the asphalt. Suddenly, someone shouted, and he turned around and asked why they were shouting so much. It was Digo, swinging his axe at an enemy soldier. Then I cut its torso in two. He looked at it in fright, and then shouted that he had hit it. The enemy soldiers looked around in fright, and one of them shouted out where they had suddenly appeared from. Digo swung his axe and cut down two of them in one blow. Doki swept past the enemy knights, cutting them in two. The enemy captain looked around in fright and then asked what the hell was going on. He watched his soldiers die one by one. Chris appeared on horseback, holding a spear, blue energy radiating from him, and he heard the enemy commander say that his soldiers were killed by some suckers. Chris looked menacingly in front of him, and then asked what could not be, he said that, this is unpleasant to hear. Then, as Chris rushed past the enemy commander, he beheaded him and told him that he had no idea how much they had plowed to get that power. Digo and Doki were standing on the road, which was littered with a huge number of corpses, all covered in blood. Diko turned around to look at the corpses, and then said that the enemies were very weak. Chris's face was smeared with blood and he smiled and said no. Doki raised two axes above his head and then shouted that he was getting stronger. Chris replied that they were just getting stronger. Knight Chris was speared and fell from his horse. The other knight clenched his teeth and swung his spear. The enemy warrior looked at him fearfully. Chris Knight pierced the heart of an enemy warrior on horseback at last. Then he swung his arm and knocked the enemy knight off his horse. The warrior's face was covered in blood, and he frowned as he thought about how many times you don't kill. He looked around at the scene of the bloody battle and wondered if there were too many enemies. The fighter looked around and then shouted for the warriors to spread out, they need to clear the way. He thought that the army consists of those who left the family, from the brawlers who did business. The warrior thought of Chris, and Linda wondered if this was how it was going to end, if those guys were gone. The warrior turned and saw two cavalrymen come around him, and someone shouted that the enemy had changed direction and were advancing from the left. The warrior gritted his teeth and thought that apart from the fact that the terrain was unfavorable, they couldn't keep up with the maneuverability of the horses, they were completely screwed. Suddenly, in front of the warrior, the enemy cavalrymen began to fall, an arrow flew at his head at high speed. The two cavalrymen who were looking at their fallen comrades shouted arrow. An arrow flew past the enemy soldier, he looked around in fright, his comrade shouted that they should immediately find out where they were shooting from. The soldier looked around and shouted that help had finally arrived, while another soldier squinted up and asked who was there. Lind was standing on a horse on the mountain. The warrior took a closer look at Lind and said that he was an archer. The enemy knights in bloodied armor looked up at the mountain and shouted that the bastard was over there, he had to be finished off. The enemy cavalrymen started to climb the mountain, and Lind immediately jumped out of the way. Lind remembered talking to Takwil, asking him what he said, that he didn't have the height. Lind looked at Tequila in frustration, then said that Chris was way ahead of them, and compared to Digo and Doki, he didn't have any strong points. Takwil glanced at Lind, then told him to take the bow and follow him. The arrow hit the target accurately, breaking through the tree trunk. Takwil was standing behind Lind, holding an apple in his hands, and then said that Lind clearly had potential. Takwil smiled and took a bite of the apple, saying that, however, something was missing. He looked down at the apple he had bitten off and added that there was no power. Takwil threw the apple up with great speed, then said that he was at war. Takwil took the bow in his hand and pulled the string, adding that there are no static targets, and there can also be a lot of surprise, an enemy sneak attack, a strong wind gust, and so on. Takwil tensed his arm, 
then said that in such a situation, in order not to miss a good moment, you need to hit the enemy with one shot. Tack will release the arrow, and it shot forward at high speed. Behind him, Lind was looking at the arrow with a puzzled expression, and Tack will continue to tell Lind not to waste time comparing himself to the others. Whether Lind could master this skill was up to him, if he was afraid, it would be better to take up the spear right now. Lin reflected that he was very grateful to Tequila. He turned his horse around, then started to draw an arrow from his quiver. Lin thought, thank you for making Tackle stronger. The enemy cavalrymen stared ahead in horror as one of them shouted that Lin had turned around. Lin drew the bowstring, then wondered what else he was grateful for. He remembered a conversation with Tackwill, where Tackwill had said that the Lind he knew was not a fool, that he would pick up a spear with such eyes. Lind let go of the bowstring, and it flew out with great force like the wind, and he wondered if Tackwill had given him the courage. Lind's arrow hit one of the cavalrymen with great force. The two remaining men looked ahead in fright, one of them shouting for his comrade to give up his shield, the other shouting for something to defend himself with. And then the cavalryman replied that his comrade should stand with a shield in front, but at that moment he was hit by an arrow right in the head. There was only one cavalryman left, fearfully covering himself with a shield. It peeked out from under the shield with only one eye, and Lind wondered if it was open. Lind's arrow instantly approached the opponent's eye. Then he fell off his horse, dropping his shield. Lind glared at them, then said that he wouldn't let anyone go. Chris's warriors were desperately fighting their opponents, and one of the fighters shouted that one day the opponents would run out. The warrior standing next to him furrowed his brows, then shouted that he needed to hold on a little longer, there weren't many enemies left. The warrior with the beard looked in front of him in fright, and then said Mother of God. Looking at the crowd of approaching enemies, he asked that narrow-eyed one, are they going to die here? The warrior looked ahead, then realized that this was really the end. He saw the enemy's horses with the red playful, and then someone shouted loudly, out of the way. The warrior with the beard looked around puzzled and asked why they were coming from there, Chris shouted that they were taking over. Chris rushed past the puzzled warrior, then shouted that all the opponents in the rear had been destroyed, leaving only that worthless pile in front. Chris, along with Digo and Daki, rode on the enemy's horses. Chris shouted that they would tear everyone to pieces. Chris deftly stabbed the spear through the throat of the enemy soldier. Digo screamed and cut the enemy knight in half. Daki cut down the enemy cavalrymen one by one. They were covered by Lind shooting arrows at the enemies. Lind ran up on his horse and shouted that he would join them. The soldier with the beard looked ahead, puzzled, and then wondered what the hell was bothering you. He glanced at Chris's team, then wondered who they were. Chris turned and saw a narrow-eyed warrior. He smiled and said that he could see that he had survived. The narrow-eyed warrior sighed heavily, and then Chris said that he had done a good job. A crowd of cavalrymen was running towards Lind, and he shouted to Chris that the enemy had changed formation and was coming at them. Chris glared around menacingly, then shouted at everyone to shut up, the enemy horses are very mobile. The enemy cavalrymen were approaching Chris's squad. Chris standing in front of them shouted that in order not to be surrounded, let them stand in two rows, they will go on a direct offensive with such a formation. The narrow-eyed warrior looked at Chris with a sad expression, then asked if it was an offensive again. Chris, looking at the narrow-eyed warrior, asked what. He smiled and replied that he thought they would lose. We are being transferred to the main scouting force of the 8th gate, the soldier running as fast as he can to the commander. He stops in the middle of the barracks and then shouts that his squad has been destroyed. The commander looks at the soldier in fright, and then asks why, answers that among the enemies there was a soldier whose strength is comparable to that of a knight. In the tent, someone overhears this conversation. The commander asks that because of the knight squad people, what is its approximate strength? The soldiers answer that the skills were at least higher than the average knight, by the way, looked very young. Suddenly, the commander and the soldier turn around in a puzzled manner, someone behind them asks that he looked young. A soldier with long hair pulled back in a bun appears in front of us, he has a big scar on his head, he looks menacingly at the commander, and then they ask that this is not by chance a kid with dark blue hair. We are taken to Chris, who is standing in front of his fighters, they are standing in front of him on horses. Chris raises his hand, and the fighter tells Chris to forgive them for their rudeness. Chris replies with a smile that they passed, this is not the first time for him. A narrow-eyed soldier looking at Chris tells him to let them introduce, his name is Slidey Hanel. Before his arrival he was in charge of this squad, next to him is a bearded soldier he says his name is Sephora he is the second in command of the squad. Chris tells them to gather all the members of the squad they need to discuss something, Slithy shouts eat. Chris is standing in front of the fighters, and Digo is sitting on a horse next to him. And then Chris, looking at the fighters, says that this is a mare with a red mane, she is much faster and stronger than ordinary horses. Chris holds out his hand with a yellow flower on it, and then says that the animal is violent by nature, so it is not easy to manage it, but if you give it this bee flower, it immediately becomes docile and docile. 
Chris, riding a red-maned horse, sped past the pumpkin. A system message popped up in his head that his riding skill was upgraded. He said it was unbelievable. He thought it would ride well on the hills. Pumpkin, standing in front of Chris, turned her face away in annoyance. Chris looked at her then asked that Pumpkin was jealous. Pumpkin bared her teeth, looked at the frightened horse, and then Chris apologized to her with a smile and replied that she knew that he had no one better than her. He added that maybe as a reconciliation they would go together to explore. Chris was looking at the map with the pumpkin walking next to him, and he wondered if he should go up to this high ground and turn left. Before Chris appeared huge bushes looking at them, he said that my mother is dear, well, the thickets are here. He glanced at the map again, and wondered if the village with the intact well was up ahead, so this was the shortest route for them to explore. He went through the bushes and saw the camp of the Eighth Gate, a troop of cavalrymen was standing below, and he told Pumpkin that they were here. Looking at them, Chris reflected that even though they had taken out most of the enemy in the previous battle, going to the breach now would be a daunting task. Chris furrowed his brows and then thought that they needed to attack suddenly, he told Pumpkin that they would go back. It was a dark night outside, and someone said to jump on the horses, they were going. Lind gave Chris a puzzled look and then asked what they would be storming at night. Chris said yes, since they didn't have much time. Chris looked up at Slithy with a smile on his horse, then asked him if everything was ready so he could give him the name of the operation. The fighters, along with Slithy, said in one voice sadly that they would shake them up. Chris replied that they were perfectly separated. Chris and his team rode to a thick stand of bushes. Sephora looked at them, puzzled, and then said that it was a thicket and they couldn't go through it on horseback. Chris swung his spear to cut through the bushes, then said that Sephora was being too shallow again, let him see if the vines and weeds in front of them were removed. A small field appeared in front of them, Chris said that they would see a field with fine medicinal grass, Murdoch went through everything here. Chris, looking ahead, said that they were moving slowly, and trying to make sure that the horses didn't make any sounds, they had to pull out all the remaining weeds. Digo was watching the Eighth's camp and ran from the bushes, he told Chris to take a look, the night scouting team was out. The enemy soldiers in the camp were smiling as they drank and ate. Digo looked ahead intently, and then said that if they had spread out their forces too much, but after all, Chris calmly replied that no, everyone in the squad is doing great. Besides, there is only one way to invade, and he just sent a night reconnaissance team there, so the rest of us need to save our forces. Chris looked down and saw a soldier with shoulder straps who was communicating with a young fighter. He said that, judging by the clothes, there is a type of commander here. Chris looked at the smiling Lind and asked if he could do it, Lind said he was still asking. An enemy fighter was standing in front of the commander asking if it was okay to drink like this now. The commander, after finishing his glass, replied that the fighter did not steam, they also sent the same faulties. The commander continued to say that even if the fighter thinks that they already have victory in their pocket, suddenly an arrow flew at him, and he fell, dropping his beer mug for dead. The soldier turned around in fright and shouted what the hell was going on. The enemy soldiers stared ahead in bewilderment as Chris's squad rode down the hill on horseback, and the soldier asked if he was drunk. The enemy cavalry squad was marching through the canyon. One of the soldiers on horseback told the scar-faced commander running ahead that there was fire ahead. Three of Chris's warriors were running on horseback, holding torches in their hands, and a soldier shouted that they were enemies, riding red-maned horses. The enemy commander looking at the thought that there should be a type somewhere nearby. Sleety was running away from the enemy soldiers with a torch in his hand. Slithy remembered Chris telling him not to go into battle at all, they were on the same horses, so the enemy wouldn't be able to catch up with them. Slithy turned around with a smile, next to the two fighters they raised their torches, Slithy said that then they just need to shake them a little. Camp 8 was already on fire, and there were corpses of enemy soldiers everywhere. Sephora turned on his horse and saw an enemy soldier, and the soldier thought that he should report the attack as soon as possible. Sephora glared at him, then asked him where he was going. Chris on horseback turned to Sephora and said that he would go after him and let Sephora destroy all the remaining opponents here, Sephora replied that he understood. Chris turned to his companions and told Lin Digo and Daki to follow him, they would meet their master. Chris's soldiers were holding torches as they ran away from the enemy cavalrymen. The enemy commander, frowning menacingly, asked that they had no archers, the soldier replied that they all remained in the personal squad. Suddenly, the enemy commanders were startled to think that they had already gone too far. The enemy commander stopped and shouted loudly for everyone to stop. The commander turned around and thought in fright that something was wrong here, that Freak had tricked them the last time, attacking from behind, the soldier asked what was wrong. The soldier reported to the commander that there was a soldier coming from behind, and the commander lowered his head and said no more. The soldier fell to his knees and shouted that the main force had been attacked, and the captain cursed loudly. He fumed, then said it was the same thing again. Sweat was running down his face, and he wondered if he needed to control himself, if they were going to bring the army back now, he might do something again. 
The commander glared at his soldiers, then said that they were dividing the squad into two parts, the first following him, and the second keeping an eye on the surrounding area. Lind and Chris were racing forward, and Lind said there was an enemy ahead. Lin drew the bowstring and fired, and Chris smiled and shouted that they should say hello. The enemy commander swung his sword fiercely and broke the arrow flying at him. Chris looked ahead with a puzzled expression. Lin said that he had deflected. Chris replied that it was the elite Alman army. The enemy commander on horseback shouted with a mad smile that such arrows wouldn't work against him. Suddenly, an arrow hit the enemy soldier's horse. The enemy commander jumped down from his horse and shouted for everyone to get off their horses. Chris jumped down from his horse and shouted that they were getting off too. Chris ran furiously at the commander, the commander shouted at the blue-haired man not to touch him, he would finish him off, the fucking freak, so they met. Chris looked at the enemy commander with a puzzled expression, then asked him if he knew him. Enemy commander frightening smiled and looked at Chris, his eyes burning red. The enemy commander appears in front of us, his body covered in blood, the wall behind him is broken, Chris says, looking at him, that they were quite strong. Chris was also covered in blood, and he smiled and said that they had recently fought four against one. Chris glanced at his comrades, who were covered in blood, and then said that, however, there was no doubt now that they were all much stronger and no longer comparable to what they were. We are being transferred to the main intelligence unit of the Cirque forces. Someone slams a fist down hard on the table. This is a commander with a thin face and a small mustache under his nose. He thinks about what the trash is doing. He has plowed so much to rise to the commander of an intelligence unit, but in reality there are only continuous losses, not to mention achievements. The commander, gritting his teeth, thinks that if he once again hits the dirt with his face, he may be demoted to the wreck. Suddenly, a soldier breaks into the habit and shouts that there is a herd of horses ahead. The commander is frightened and asks what. The soldier, looking at the herd of horses, shouts that they are all with a red mane. The commander, cursing, says that this is the eighth gate. The commander, squinting and looking ahead, shouts that the soldier urgently called the archers to take up positions. Let everyone else prepare for battle, he cannot believe that they went to the right. In response, the freaks went, the soldier replies that he obeys. Suddenly, the soldier approaches the commander and says that he thinks that he can calm down. The commander looks at the soldier with a puzzled expression and asks what he is talking about. The commander squints forward, and the soldiers looking at the red-maned horses say that there is their flak. Chris gets down on one knee in front of the commander and says that they defeated the enemy cavalry, consisting of 200 people, then took possession of the horses, also destroyed the main reconnaissance unit of the enemy, which should be done in the village area. The commander looks at Chris with a puzzled expression and thinks that he heard that his squad consisted of only 100 riders, and then the commander asks what Chris did. Chris smiles, and then says that the commander should not ask, it is better to provide him with 300 agile cavalrymen. The commander, frowning, thinks that in this case he has no choice but to agree. Chris is riding a horse and riding through the forest with his small army. Chris thinks that's probably enough. His soldiers furiously raise their hands and shout. Chris shouts to them to stop all the soldiers. They need to rest here, let them eat along and sleep tonight. Chris is approached by Lind and asked what they will do now. Chris replies that they need to do what they are good at. Chris looks ahead and then says they'll hit from behind. We are taken to the enemy commanders, one of them shouts that even their main reconnaissance unit has been destroyed, what should they do now? The white-haired Brazilian commander crossed his arms and wondered what was going on again. He looked ahead and thought that it wasn't an accident, that he had foiled all their plans, just like in the time of the white demon. The commander gritted his teeth and thought that it was the same scum. He glared ahead, his brow furrowed, and then wondered who the hell he was. And then the grizzled commander said that he thought they couldn't stall any longer, they were preparing for a direct offensive. He glanced at the bronze-armored commander and said that Sir Rinuan trusted him to pass on the squad, Rinuan replied with a frown that he obeyed. He looked at the military man with a thick beard and curly hair standing next to him, and then said that General Alian, the central troops on him, he replied that he understood, this general is the commander of the 3,000-man legion, General Alian. The grizzled commander looked ahead and said the last thing, Sir Bonatos. He glanced at the knight in black armor covering his entire body and said that he was charging him with the rear army. Knight Bonatos the spur replied there. All the commanders came out of the tent. Then the grizzled captain turned to Sir Bonatos and told him to listen. Bonatos paused and listened as the captain said that there was a chance that a force would appear to attack their rear. The captain closed his eyes and said that maybe it would be the same one who had defeated their main intelligence unit, he thought they would just use the stolen horses. The captain, frowning, continued to say that maybe it was just a hunch, but it seems to him that this time they must definitely destroy the leader of their squad. We are taken to Chris, who is drinking milk with her comrades, and the enemy commander tells Bonatos to catch the creature by all means. We are taken to the general's office, where the count's eldest son is standing next to him, to report that Chris's mobile troops have destroyed the main enemy intelligence unit. 
The general wonders if they can believe that he really did it, if he really underestimated this kid. The general glanced at the Count's eldest son and thought that Chris was a brilliant fighter and that there was no way he should lose such a fighter. The general got up from the table and tapping his hand on it, thought that enough thoughts, this place, the battlefield, you need to do business. The general turned to the Count's son, while then adjusting the armor said that from now on, he would hand over the manual to him, the Count's son replied that he understood. The general shouted loudly for all the members of the Ludwig Knight squad to gather. Standing in front of the cavalry, he pulled out a pike and said that it was time for them to show themselves. Soldiers armed with spears marched forward. Lind looked menacingly ahead, then said that both sides had finally gathered all their strength, they would soon be facing each other. Chris glanced at Lind and then told them to go, their army was enough. A soldier ran forward, shouting, holding a spear in front of him. Suddenly, someone pierced his chest, and the soldier spat out blood. The enemy soldier, having stuck the soldier's spear, shouted die. The enemy soldier, putting the soldier on the ground, put his foot on him and swung his spear, the soldier desperately shouted to be spared. Two soldiers stared ahead in horror, one of them shouted that this was a completely different level. The enemy sent elite troops, the soldier's comrade glared at him and shouted at him to stop talking nonsense, come to his senses and fight. The enemy soldier looked ahead and laughed, then said that look at them trembling in fear, the pitiful mutts finally understood where they belonged. Suddenly, the enemy soldier turned around in a puzzled manner, not understanding why there were shouts from behind. Behind him was Daki, who cut off the soldier's head with a single swing. Chris, on horseback, held out his spear and shouted that the enemy was defenseless. Chris, along with his squad on horseback, cut down the enemy soldiers one by one. Len drew the bowstring and fired. Chris frowned to the side and then thought, great, you need to keep fighting back, and then separate. The soldier looked away in fright as an enemy soldier approached. Then a soldier was speared through the neck and his horse was struck down. Slithy looked out at the carnage. Then he shouted at Chris at the top of his voice. Chris and Digo turned around in confusion, and Slithy shouted that the enemy was in the rear. Chris looked back, startled. The enemy cavalry was destroying his soldiers, and someone shouted that they were surrounded. Soldier Chris was stabbed in the throat with a spear. He started to fall off his horse. Lind looked back in fright and said that the same scum, how did they know that they would come from the rear? Chris gritted his teeth, and then thought that this was his mistake, that he had been too presumptuous, that he should have considered everything carefully. Chris saw his soldier being stabbed in the neck with a spear, and he thought that he understood that there were casualties on the battlefield, but to see dozens of soldiers die because of one order right in front of him. Chris glared ahead, then realized that it was very hard for him. Lind looked at Chris, who looked angry, and then Chris shouted loudly to Digo and Doki to clear the road on the left side, they're getting out of here. Doki and Digo frowned and shouted eat. Together they rushed at the enemy army, sparing no one and slashing down one by one the enemy warriors, Doki shouted that they would break through. Chris glared around him, then told all the soldiers to fall back. Benados appears in front of us, shouting that the enemy is fleeing, and ordering his warriors to catch them immediately. Chris looks at Benados and wonders what the enemy leader is doing. Chris examines Benados and thinks that he has the moon emblem on his helmet, he is from the Despair family. Chris, standing next to Lind, says that they are moving on to the second strategy. Lind is puzzled and asks why. Lind frowns at Chris and then says he's never heard of it, and Chris tells him not to sweat it. Chris looks ahead with a frown and then says that he will lead them to victory by all means. Lind looks at Chris and thinks. The allied squad is rushing at the enemy army, someone shouts, to all the troops. A general in bronze armor shouts that they are launching an assault. The general, along with his cavalry, begins to destroy enemy soldiers. Elian, clenching his teeth, shouts menacingly that he sees that the half-dead old man has lost his temper. The general, sitting on a horse with a smile, shouts that whoever is talking, he himself does not look very young. The soldier approaches the Count's eldest son and addresses him. The soldier shouts that the enemy squad that attacked Chris's troops from the rear is chasing them, send them a squad to help. The Count's son is afraid to think about what to do, even his father went to the battlefield, this bastard Chris, what a circus he arranged. The Count's son is approached by the commanders, who say that Chris's cavalry unit is now in the enemy camp, moreover, their main allied unit has gathered all its forces in order to defend here, they have no way to take part of the soldier away from here, the Count's son replies that he himself knows. The Count's son thinks in fright, and then shouts that they will not send a rescue team, let them send even more soldiers to the vanguard, the soldier shouts that he obeys the commander-in-chief. The son of the Count thinks that Chris made this mess himself, if he dies, then there's nothing to do, if you survive, it won't be too late to take him to your own hands. Chris and Lin started forward. Benados, along with the cavalry, raced after them, the soldier shouted that if they continued and finally left the battlefield, Benados shouted for a hundred elite soldiers to follow him, the rest to return and help the allies. Benados smiled and shouted that he would never miss the cheeky lamb. 
Chris and his squad were running down the ravine, being chased by Bonato's elite squad, and a small space appeared in front of them. Lind looked ahead and said they were there, right here. Chris turned around and shouted for everyone to drop everything on the ground. The fighters were holding black bombs in their hands. A black cloud of smoke appeared in front of Bonato's elite squad. As Bonato's pushed through it, he called out, what a fog. Chris stood in front of the fog and shouted to his comrades to leave quickly before the fog enveloped them. From now on, his second-in-command Lind would be in charge of the squad. Lind, sitting on his horse, turned to Chris and shouted at him to be careful. Enemy wars were fought on horses as if in pitch darkness. One warrior asked where he was, another said he couldn't see shit. Then Otto's gritted his teeth and started to jump down from his horse, thinking that the horses were panicking. Now they were useless, he shouted that they were getting off their horses. The soldiers pressed their backs to each other, Bonatos shouted for everyone to gather nearby. Organizing a circular defense, let them not attack the people in the area thoughtlessly, the enemy can't see them either. Chris glanced ahead at the enemy soldiers and wondered if it was true that he, too, couldn't see what was happening ahead. He lowered his head and wondered what, however, thanks to the fine sense he'd gained from mastering wise and the ability to sense the killing energy that Taquil had taught him. Chris looked ahead and saw the glare of the soldiers, and he wondered if he could feel them moving. Lind, along with Daki and Digo, stood in front of the black fog. Sephora came up to them and asked them if they really should leave the commander there alone, maybe it's time to go rescue him. Lind looked down sadly. He remembered Chris' training session. I remembered him telling Taquil that he was watching Chris learn different techniques. Taquil replied that of course, because each of them has different predispositions. Lind looked at Tikal carefully, and Tikal went on to say that Chris was a little different, though. To tell the truth, in the process of learning, he looks very persistent. Chris hit the target again and again, and then went on to say that, however, it was through this insatiability that he grew at an incredibly high rate. Taquil is about to be coaxed, which is a bit unpleasant to admit, but it feels like this 15-year-old boy is already on par with him, although no, he may have already jumped above him. Taquil looked at Lind with a smile, then asked him what it was that made him envious, and Lind smiled and said that he wasn't, not at all. Lind glanced ahead, then asked that where else would there be a stalwart commander like Chris. Digo looked at Lind carefully. Lind furrowed his brows, then said that he believed in Chris, Chris could handle it. The enemy soldiers stared blindly, surrounded by black smoke. One of the soldiers moved. At the same time, a fountain of blood spurted out of his throat. The soldiers looked around in fright and one of them shouted that from the side, he was dead, the enemy was somewhere nearby. One soldier stopped in fright when he heard the words, it's very dark, yes. Chris went on to say that this place is called the Well of Mist, and there are hills on both sides, so if you get stuck in this fog, it will not be easy to get out of it, which is why he is being nice to them. The soldier gritted his teeth and asked in fright what the hell the rat was talking about. At the same time, blood gushed out from his companion. He turned around in fright and shouted that here, next to him, although no, to the right, a comrade of the enemy soldier shouted to calm down the soldier. At the same time, Chris decapitated another soldier, the soldier shouted that he was here. The enemy soldier was left alone, he held out his spear and then asked where everyone was. Chris, standing next to the soldier, said that he could say thank you to them, he had a lot of fun, but this is far from the end. The enemy soldier stood there in fright, Chris went on to say that from now on, they would only have one feeling. Chris crept up behind the enemy soldier and then whispered fear. The enemy soldier turned around in fright, looking for Chris. He stood still, not moving he thought that apart from screams nothing can be heard, at this rate and he will soon die. The soldier took a small step forward and thought that he needed to get out of here right away, he couldn't just die here. Suddenly, he tripped over something. The enemy soldier fell to the ground. Lying on the ground, he looked around and thought that he had tripped over something, he thought that the screams had stopped. He groped for the dead soldier's head, then said it couldn't have been. She jumped up dumbfounded then shouted that everyone was already dead. At the same time, Chris speared the enemy soldier in the throat. Chris, his brow furrowed, held a spear in his hands and looked menacingly at the soldier. He said that he had hit the nail on the head, he was the last one in this direction. Then Otto's, standing near his soldiers, shouted that no one should move and let them control themselves, the enemy is trying to cause them to panic. Suddenly, someone swung a sword. It was Bonatos who was able to determine where Chris was standing, Chris jumped out of the way. The enemy knight looked at his general and said that the knight, just now, Bonatos shouted at the soldier to shut up, otherwise he wouldn't be able to track down that freak. Chrisa looked at Bonatos with a puzzled expression, and then thought, here's a knight, you can't deal with him that easily. Chris stood quietly and looked ahead, and Bonatos smiled and said it was the end of his tricks, you fucking rat. Chris reflected that no, he still had a lot of aces up his sleeve. Chris swung the dagger, then wondered what he was doing. An enemy soldier standing near Bonato's screamed in pain as the dagger landed right on his shoulder. An enemy soldier standing behind Bonato's shouted that the enemy was throwing daggers at them. 
Bonatos clenched his teeth and angrily shouted that he was a cowardly idiot. Bonatos thought that he had covered up all his tracks. Bonatos, his back to his knight, shouted that they were retreating and coming out of the smoke screen. An enemy knight standing behind Bonatos asked where they should go then. The smoke screen and the gorge continued to operate. An enemy soldier ran out of it, shouting that it was the devil. At the same time, the soldier fell and was hit in the head by an arrow. Lind glared at his allies, then shouted for them to kill anyone running out. Digo and Daki were standing near the exit from the fog, their weapons discarded. Daki looked ahead, and Bonato's head popped out of the smoke screen. Daki looked at the smoke and said that someone was coming out. Digo looked menacingly ahead and stopped Daki with his hand and asked him to wait. Chris came out of the smoke, and Digo said happily that it was the commander. Digo, standing next to Bonato's head, began to say that thank god Chris was safe, he asked that there was no one left inside, Chris replied that he didn't quite think there were a couple of flies there. Digo turned to Chris and told him to wait, he would figure it out completely. Chris turned around and said that it was not necessary, let them leave them alone, it was good for them. Near the smoke said that now, as soon as possible, they should put their equipment in order and return to the front. Lind on horseback finally said that here was their commander-in-chief himself, everyone was exhausted from the long battle, and it would be nice to rest for a few days and recuperate. Chris glanced at Lind, who was smiling, and then said it was a great solution. Evening came. Lind Daka stood and looked up at the sky, and then Lind said he opened up in shock. In the gorge, as the house curtain fell, there were mountains of enemy corpses, Lind looked at them and said that he had made a mess here. Lind clenched his fist, and then thought that he too could wield wise, Chris had taught him, he could do the same. Daki Lind and Digo looked ahead and smiled, and then Lind said it didn't look like he was the only one who was boiling blood. We are transferred to two days later, Lind holding a letter in her hands goes to Chris and says that the letter is from the commander of the reconnaissance squad. Lind takes out the letter and begins to read it says that it says that Count Van Ludwig's night squad crossed the enemy camp. Chris asked what the damage was, Lind replied that half of the squad was killed, but the enemy also had considerable losses. Chris reflected that the Count's company wouldn't break them so easily, after all, Lind looked at Chris and then said that the exact same person, he had a new nickname, the enemy commander that he killed was a famous knight from the Despair family. Lind went on to say that it looked like the survivors were soldiers and started a rumor about Chris calling him the Black Smoke Devil. The enemy commander with white hair and beard was reading the letter, he wondered what the Black Smoke Devil was, he couldn't believe that even Bonatos was dead. Suddenly, a soldier burst into the tent, the commander looked around and thought that he was betting that their intelligence unit was also destroyed by that freak. His skills are no worse than knights, so that there would be no disastrous consequences, we need to cut his throat as soon as possible. The enemy commander turned around and wondered what to do, but a soldier shouted that Van Ludwig was advancing. The enemy commander raised his hand to the side and then said that all soldiers should prepare for an attack, he reflected that there were still enough problems here. Sleety, holding the letter in his hands, asked if it was worth sending a letter in the current situation, said it was a good idea, and Chris said it was important. Chris on horseback thought that in his previous life, this incident happened a few days later, but now everything is already at war, since the future has been distorted, he must not lose his vigilance, he must be ready. Chris turned around, Slithy asked where to send the letter, and Chris said threateningly that it was to the royal palace. Sephora stood in front of the commander and asked him to give them some cavalrymen to help them. The commander frowned and asked why, Sephora replied that he didn't really know the reason, there was only an order to gather at David Fortress, in front of Sunset Hyde. The commander asked what Chris was wearing, Sephora replied that his current location was unknown. He just suggested meeting in three days before Sunset Hyde. We are transported to Davith, Sunset Hyde, and a huge fortress. A soldier standing on the castle walls shouts in fright that a squad of cavalrymen is ahead. Ralph swears through gritted teeth, and then says that as soon as he goes out on shift, something happens, the soldier looks ahead and says that these are allies. Ralph turns around, puzzled, and asks what other allies there are. Chris looks at the wall and then says that he is Chris, he had to leave the battlefield to deliver an urgent message. Chris walks up to Ralph, looking puzzled and being asked what he's doing here, Ralph says he should be the one asking, and then adds that you're welcome. Ralph looks at Chris with a smile and then says that he was sent to Highgard, and recently he returned back, by the way, now such rumors go around. Chris is called the Devil of Black Smoke and they say that Chris single-handedly destroyed a group of 100 elite fighters. This is true, Chris replies that people, of course a bit hyped out of a molehill, but yes, it's true. Chris looks at Ralph, who is holding a spear then says that with his leg, Ralph, leaning on the spear saying that he was wounded in battle, the healers throw up their hands said that running like before he will not be able to. Chris frowns at Ralph, and then says that if he needs anything, let him tell him, Chris thinks that even with his healing skills, it will be difficult to cure such a thing. 
Ralph with a smile looking at Chris leaving says that then let them have a drink, as the war ends. Many people do not believe that he fought shoulder to shoulder with Chris, so he has a drink. Chris with a smile replies that it is covered. Chris started to climb the stairs and reflected that when he had visited this place himself, he had realized that most of the guards here were wounded soldiers. Strick stood on the city walls, then looked away and asked why Chris had come. Chris approached Strick and told him that he had an urgent report, that there were enemy troops nearby, and Strick asked what they meant. Chris, looking at the restless Strick, said that on the way back, after smashing the enemy's rear, he found that some of the enemy forces were leaving the battlefield and moving forward. Strick asked what was serious, so they were moving here. I thought that the stump is clear, he made it up, but those guys will still come here in the end. They are going to make a change of step and aim for the king, bypassing all the pawns, knights and bishops. Suddenly, someone came up and shouted Commander Strick. There was a huge army in front of the castle, someone shouted that there were enemy troops ahead, there were at least 2,000 of them. Strick looked at the soldier in fright, Chris frowned and thought. A man in a yellow sweatshirt was standing by the wagon, and he said that if you hadn't insisted on a night battle in Sunset Hyde. Lind was holding a pint of beer and looking at Chris and saying that if they could hold off the enemy just one more day, only the world would change. Lind drank a pint of beer and asked what difference it made, though. The enemy army was standing in an even formation in front of the castle. Strick, looking at the enemy army, asked why there were so many troops here. Cross frowned, thinking that he knew they'd get here much faster than the trash, that Narrow Eye was still on his way, and that Sephora wouldn't arrive until tomorrow. Chris glanced at Strick and then asked how many forces were currently available inside the fortress, and Strick replied that even if you count the archers and wounded soldiers, there would be more than 200 people here. When he looked at the enemy army, he wondered what was happening. The 200 cavalrymen that he had called with him, everything that they had, with such forces, they wouldn't even last a quarter of a day. Chris glanced at the enemy warriors and saw the flag with the image of a wolf, wondered what that flag and cry were. He looked at them carefully and wondered if they were all from the wolf's family, which might be a good idea. The enemy soldiers started banging on the drums, and not violently beaten because of all the forces. Strick gritted his teeth and said threateningly, this time, Chris wondered if they were just trying to intimidate them. Suddenly Chris felt something, he wondered if he could faintly feel the killing energy on his right. Chris glanced to his right and saw a fighter standing nearby. Looking at him, he thought that as soon as he turned his head, it abruptly disappeared. By the way, that guy is not even a commander, but an ordinary private. The fighter glanced at Chris, and Chris wondered why he was standing unarmed when on alert. Strick looked at Chris with a puzzled expression, and Chris wondered what exactly, now he understood why the drums were needed. Strick looked at Chris and told her where he was going. He looked straight ahead for a moment. A soldier who was standing on the wall jumped at him, holding a dagger in front of him. Chris managed to drink the dagger from the soldier's hand with his fist, thinking that this was a signal that it was now possible to attack the fortress commander. Stricka looked puzzled as he called out what was going on. The fighter Chris had knocked back wondered who he was, but he was able to parry quickly. Chris approached the fighter and said that means he is the instigator of everything. The fighter leaped back, a dagger coming out of his hand. He made a quick swing, but Chris dodged it with a crouch. Chris glared at the fighter. Then, with great force, I punched him in the side. The fighter flew several meters away. Strick pointed a finger at the fighter and shouted for everyone to gather, and immediately catch this creature Chris looked at the fighter and then thought that he didn't have a drop of hesitation. He was definitely a professional killer. The soldiers gathered around the spy, and Strick shouted at them not to attack randomly, this guy is dangerous. Chris looked at the tasks in front of him, he thought that he was hired by the 8th gate, he came from where? We need to ask him, Chris turned to the spy and asked that he was Knight Dugger. The spy didn't say anything, but glared at Chris. And then he asked, looking at Chris, who he was, Chris wondered what he guessed, Chris said that this is the territory on him. Chris frowned menacingly to the side and told him to follow Amnoko's strict rule. The spy, holding his hand, looked at Chris in fright, Chris wondered what he had reacted to. This is the rule of absolute subordination of knight daggers to the highest ranks. Spy dropped to his knees, and Chris wondered if he'd thought he was using a phrase he'd accidentally overheard here. Strick shouted loudly for the spy to be captured, and the soldiers replied that they were obeying. The soldiers grabbed the spy, who didn't resist, and then Chris said that they should put him in an underground cell, there was a lot to be learned from him. Strick frowned and said it was a good idea. The spy was looking intently in Chris's direction. Chris looked out of the castle gate, then pointed to the side. Chris, standing on the castle walls, replied that they did not come tonight to attack. Strick asked why Chris decided that. Chris replied that he thought the sound of drums was a signal for the assassin, since the troops did not receive an answer from the assassin. Obviously they are not thinking about a new strategy. Chris looked at Strick and said that's why they can rest. Strick said that tomorrow they will fight back. Chris, looking at the puzzled Strick, said that tomorrow they would open the gates of the fortress and go outside and prevent the enemy from entering. Chris was standing in front of the pumpkin patch, 
telling her that she would have to stay here tomorrow, but he would definitely come back for her, so don't worry. Pumpkin laid her muzzle on the bed next to Chris, and Chris thought that the man would definitely show up tomorrow. Knight who managed to break through Sunset Hyde's defenses, the youngest user of Wise from the 8th gate. Chris, taking off his t-shirt, looked menacingly ahead, and then said Perth. Chris stepped out onto the castle walls, then looked at Strick in surprise and asked him why he had been standing there all night. Strick looked ahead with a tired look, he said that it didn't show what Chris was doing, since he just came in, Chris thought that they put him in a coffin even more beautifully. But this is not surprising. Chris looked over the castle walls, and then said to lower the bridge, Strick nervously replied that he was completely stupid, there are 2,000 of them. Chris looked at Strick's word, then said that the fortress will still come to an end when the enemy breaks through the wall, Strick replied that Sunset Hide Fortress, it will never collapse. Chris, standing next to Strick, wondered what he had already lost the ability to reason normally, what he was planning to say to his mind so far. Chris glared at Strick, then said that he was right, if only the Baron's Night Squad and bigger troops were around, Strick wanted everyone in Dave to just take a break at once. Strick gritted his teeth, then asked what Chris was suggesting, surrender. Chris frowned at Strick and said that the answer was wrong, they would go outside and fight, so let them open the fortress gates, he would take all the responsibility. Strick's brow furrowed, and then he said, damn you. Docky was walking ahead of his friends holding a flag, Lind asked that Chris was loyal, that it would work. Chris, going forward, said that the wolves family, the weakest in terms of not the power of money, they are not from high society, and because of diplomacy they are not responsible. Linda, Nam glanced at Chris, and Chris went on to say that the wolves were recognized because they had a value that they were willing to sacrifice their own lives for, he says. Chris smiled and said, Honor. An enemy army appears in front of us, led by a middle-aged man finally. Alec Wolves, the commander-in-chief of the wolves' troops, is addressed and told that there are four enemies ahead. Chris and his companions step forward, and Alec wonders what the four of them are going to do, surrender. Chris hits the ground with his spear, and then looking at the enemy army shouts that he is Squire Chris, he received an order from the commander of Sunset Hyde Fortress, he demands a duel, if they can be suppressed, they will open the gate and serve weapons. Alec frowns and looks ahead, then asks that some knight apprentice is asking for a duel. Alec smiled broadly, and Chris wondered if this was the expected reaction, if he'd been able to provoke him. Chris, looking menacingly ahead, shouts that he is Squire Chris, puts his own reputation on the line, and swears to keep his promise. Did the wolf soldiers shit their pants when they saw the four of them? Are they going to forget about their honor? Alec's brow furrowed, and his anger knew no bounds. Alec calmed down and said that Chris knew their mouths, he would make him regret what he said. Chris shouted loudly that then he would take his answer as consent, a sign of proof of his promise that he would leave the fortress gates open. Alec glared at Chris and wondered if he was stupid, if the wind had blown his roof off. A soldier standing behind Alec said that he could not be trusted, he could deceive them. This was their chance, and they would not attack with all their strength and invade the fortress. Alec turned to the soldier and said that he was a brainless idiot, he was going to disgrace the honor of wolves, which they had protected so much all this time, if he opened his mouth again, he would erase it. Alec shouted loudly to see if there were any people willing to bite out the throats of these crazy suckers. A soldier with shoulder straps came out of the enemy's army, shouted that the squire was Naphtaline, and asked for this opportunity. The fighter stepped forward in front of Chris. He flexed his fists and said with a smile that he was Squire Naphtal, serving Sir Zaren. Digo stepped forward, an axe in his hand, and calmly said that his name was Digo. He was from Circa, and he was the commander-in-chief of the Century in the Chris Cavalry. Naphtalus laughed and asked the Centuries if he was going to fight the Green Kids. Naphtal took off, holding his spear in front of him, and shouted that if he didn't know his place, he would pay with his life. Digo glared ahead. Then, with a single blow, he sliced through Naphtali's torso, saying next. Digo stood beside the slash corpse. Alec looked at him and wondered what the monstrous force was, but the commander standing behind him said that he was simply thrown away. An enemy commander came forward with big lips he said he was the commander of the Fox Century. He wondered what fucking Naphthalus how could he lose so easily. He looked at Digo and thought that those who rely only on brute strength will always have a weak spot. Fox charged forward, sword in hand, toward Digo. Digo swung his halberd and deflected the attacker's attack. Fox looked at Digo with a puzzled expression, thinking that it was useless to attack head-on. He came back from being hit by Digo and thought that he couldn't always control that kind of power, he would definitely have a chance. Fock looked ahead, puzzled. Digo looked him straight in the eye, frowning, and Fock wondered what his reaction was. Then Digo hit the enemy commander on the elbow. Fock leaned back, blood spurting from her nose, and wondered if this was absurd. Fock fell to the ground, and Digo glared at the side and said the next one. A bald man stepped forward and nervously said that he was the commander of the century. A second later, my head flew off my shoulders, and Digo said the next one. Digo smashed down the enemies one by one, 
and the enemy commander was thrown to the side. Digo made a dash forward toward the enemy commander, and the commander, looking at him, stretched out his hand and shouted in fright that he should wait. The commander with the scarred eye smiled and said that he had not yet given his name, his name was. Digo stood by the huge number of commanders he had killed and shouted to the next one. The enemy commander was startled to think that he had defeated as many as five commanders on his own. Chris, looking at him, smiled and thought that now the morale of the enemy is on top. Chris, standing next to Lin, shouted at Digo to let Lin continue. Digo turned around and said that he could still fight. Chris smiled and said that he knew, let him go back, Chris thought that you can't waste all your energy here. The enemy commander appeared in front of Lind. Chris glanced at Linda and then said that the sword Linda was in very good condition right now. Lind the stern looked at his opponent and took up a stance, and Chris wondered if there was anyone who could take out a member of his squad in a duel. The enemy commander smiled and thought that this type looked much weaker than the previous one. The enemy commander swung his sword, but Lin dodged it. The enemy commander struck out in front of him, smiling maliciously, and Lin just blocked. The enemy commander, smiling, laughed and shouted that wherever you go, there is someone like him everywhere. The enemy commander lunged forward, but Chris dodged and swung his sword. Then, with a deft movement, he cut off the enemy's head. Lind swung his sword blood flying everywhere he said that he kills with one blow. Lind walked on, his name being happily shouted from the city walls. Behind Alec stood a warrior in bronze armor, gray hair and three scars on his face. Alec shouted, Pen, go, Pen answered yes. Peng stepped forward, holding a large, heavy sword. He said that he was a wolf knight named Peng. Chris the Terrible looked at him and thought that the enemy was gradually starting to bring out strong fighters, so they should respond in kind. Doki stepped forward, holding an axe. He said his name was Doki. Pen glared at Doki and asked him his rank, but Doki frowned and said he was a century commander. Doki took off, and Peng held out his sword. Peng glared at Doki and thought that if he kept his distance from him, his axe wouldn't be of any use at all. Peng approached and looked directly into Doki's eyes, he wondered what if he suddenly increased the distance between them. Doki swung the axe around, and Pan dodged it and shouted that this was what I expected from a puppy who didn't even know the basics. Doki blocked the blow with his axes, but lost his balance. Peng swung at him and shouted that he still had to learn and learn, did he really think that he could block his huge blade with his axe? Digo glanced at Doki, startled, and Lind was standing nervously beside him. Doki flew a couple of meters away and Pan was standing in front of him, smiling contentedly. Daka had blood on his face and shouted order, However, he frowned menacingly at the front, there was blood on his forehead, and shouted that he was very angry now. He took off in an instant, and he got into a fight with Pan, Pan blocked the blows, smiling happily, he shouted that he would never let anyone get closer to him. Doki swung his axe, Pang blocked the attack with his sword, then shouted that such cheap tricks wouldn't work with him. Doki pushed off with great force and began to approach Pan. Pang looked ahead with a mad smile and shouted at him to attack, he couldn't parry the attack with one hand. Doki let go of his axe. Peng, looking ahead in fright, thought that he had let go of his weapon, that he was completely mad. Doki swung the side of his axe, and Pan blocked it. Peng started to lose his balance, and he was startled to think that he was able to parry. Doki swung his other axe and shouted how much noise it made. He decapitated Pan with a single blow. Pan's head was on the ground, and Doki looked up at the sky and started shouting happily. Digo, looking ahead, said that Doki is just awesome but did not add that he had a good idea. Alec calmly looked ahead, and from behind the commander shouted that at this rate they would fall for the enemy's trick, we need to start storming the fortress. Alec beheaded the commander who said that. He gritted his teeth and shouted that they were losing to just four icicles. Alec, looking ahead, shouted that Perth was ready to fight, and replied that it was. Soldier Wolves appears in front of us, the commander of the military unit, ride on wolves he has long hair and bronze armor he shouts that can he go first? Alec shouts that okay, let Rhydon go first. Chris smiled and looked at Doki, who had blood all over his face and said that he was doing a great job, let him stop the bleeding as soon as possible. Chris frowned forward and started to draw his sword from behind his back, then said that it was his turn now. He stepped out in front of the enemy knight Rhydon. Rhydon narrowed his eyes and looked ahead. Looking at the enemy soldiers, he thought that he was sure that the man was somewhere among them, he would recognize him at a glance. Geniuses of the Eighth Gate the youngest wiser, the hero who destroyed Sunset Hyde. Suddenly Chris looked away and wondered what he had found. He looked in front of him and saw a guy with long hair and expensive armor and he wondered if this was Perth. Chris glared ahead. Pert was standing behind the enemy commander and Chris wondered if Pert was looking at him. The enemy commander frowned and smiled and told Cross not to pretend he wasn't here, his name was Rhydon Wolves. Chris put his hand on his armor and then apologized to Rhydon for his tactlessness, adding that he was a squire from Circa, his name was Chris. Rhydon glared at Chris and said it meant he was stronger than the other three, he heard ahead, and Chris frowned and said he wouldn't disappoint him. 
Rhydon took off, pulled the shield in front of him, and shouted for Chris to do his best. Rhydon swung his sword in front of him, sparks flying everywhere. Chris swung his spear threateningly, but Rhydon held up his shield. Suddenly, he lowered his shield and lunged forward. The sword almost made contact with Chris, but Chris dodged it, and then thought that he was attacking with his shield completely covering himself, it seems that he has a lot of combat experience. Chris, looking at Radon used his technique, the spear flew from all directions, he thought that if so, let him try to parry this blow as well. Radon, looking at him, was startled and wondered what his technique was. Radon placed a shield in front of him and was able to block Chris' technique. Chris, looking at the surviving Radon, wondered if he was able to block his enhanced snake tongue attack, this kid is stronger than he thought. Chris sighed and wondered if he'd underestimated him, if he needed to change tactics, if he was using the dance Taquil had taught him. Chris closed his eyes and took a stance. He wondered what to do first. Chris slowly opened his eyes. He walked around the shield-covered Raiden and wondered what he was doing smoothly. He imagined the notes in his head and thought that he was playing a melody in his head, now he didn't feel the weight of the spear. Radon covered his brow with a shield and thought that he had definitely seen this dance-like technique before. Chris slammed his spear into the shield with great force. Radon started to lose his balance, and the longer the melody played, the faster the tempo, the incredible power and speed. Chris was incredibly fast and accurate in delivering a huge number of punches to the enemy. Rhydon stared dumbfounded in front of him, wondering if Chris was throwing punches when the rhythm stopped. Chris' punches kept hitting Rhydon, and he wondered if he couldn't keep up with the rhythm, he wouldn't be able to dodge like this. He looked in front of him in fright, and then asked what Chris's connection to Dancing Sword was. Chris looked at his opponent and then wondered if he knew Tikal Dancing Sword, a nickname Tikal got when he was in his 20 seconds. Rhydon swung his sword, but Chris dodged it and said that he couldn't believe that Rhydon was able to survive after seeing this tackle technique when he wasn't a wiser himself, he was lucky. Chris dodged Rhydon's punch and said one. Chris thrust his spear forward and pierced Rhydon's throat as he shouted that his luck was up. Rhydon fell to his knees, gasping for breath, and Chris looked at him with a puzzled expression. Alec looked ahead with a frown and said that even Rhydon had lost, what for? Perth stepped forward and said, looking menacingly ahead, that Mr. Alec would let him out. Brows furrowed, he looked ahead and wondered what had finally happened. Chris hit the ground with his spear and thought that now he would be able to make sure that his skills had improved. Chris stared ahead menacingly, and then wondered what it was as well. As Pert walked forward, Chris thought that this was a chance to defeat a hero who had gone down in history. Pert stopped in front of Chris and said he had a suggestion. Chris looked at him, puzzled. Perth frowned and said that whoever wins the duel will put an end to this battle. Chris smiled and asked if he had the right to suggest such a thing. Alec shouted loudly that he was Alec, putting the family's honor on the line, and vowing that if Perth was defeated, all their soldiers would retreat. Pert smiled and looked at Chris, then asked that there was no problem now. Chris frowned at him. Perth shouted loudly that then he would introduce himself, his name was Perth Wolves. Chris looked ahead. He started to get nervous, and Perth continued to shout that he grew up in the Wolves family and at 21 years old was voted the youngest knight by Wiser. Perth furrowed his brows and shouted that today he would destroy the enemy in front of him and be the first to cross Sunset Hive. The enemy soldiers started happily shouting Perth, Chris thought that the situation had changed dramatically, just an incredible mood. Chris shouted loudly that he was a circus squire named Chris. Chris glared at Perth, then shouted that at the age of 17, he had learned the power of Wise himself. Standing in front of Perth, he shouted that he was Wiser Chris, challenging Knight Wiser Perth to a duel. Perth gave Chris a puzzled look and asked, why is it 17? Chris wants him to believe that. Chris took up a stance with his spear outstretched and said that he would prove it in battle. Perth took off. He immediately approached Reese and looked into his eyes. Docky looked at him in dismay and said that he was fast, and Lind asked in a puzzled voice what time he had made it. Perth smiled and told Chris to try it. Perth swung his sword at Chris with great force, sending a huge amount of sparks flying around. Chris was thrown away, holding the spear in front of him in fright. Perth swung his sword again and glared at Chris, asking him what he had done. Perth hit Chris's spear again. Chris, looking into Perth's eyes, wondered what kind of power he had. Perth threw Chris a couple of meters away. Chris thought it was too dangerous, he'd better step back for now. Perth glanced at Chris and asked him where he was going. Perth pulled his sword forward at high speed and threw Chris backwards, causing Chris to lose his balance and fall. Digo and Lin shouted Commander in fright. Chris stood up, everything was covered in dust, and rubbed his eyes with his hand. Pert looked at Chris with a smile and thought that his reaction and judgment were excellent. This type is not simple. And then Pert said that Chris somehow managed to avoid his blow. It seems that Chris really is a wiser. Chris glared at Perth, his arm been cut open and a small scratch on his cheek. Chris glanced at the armband and wondered what he wanted bowed down. His armband was kicking, he hadn't expected such power. Chris, looking ahead, thought that they were both wisers, 
but he clearly felt the difference in strength. This guy. Looking at Pert, Chris thought that he had reached the third level of wise and mastered the double ability, which allows you to double your own strength. Perth lunged at Chris with his sword. Chris panicked at the last moment was able to dodge. Perth hit Chris' spear, a huge amount of sparks appeared, Chris could not stand on his feet, and shouted that this was all. Perth punched Chris in the stomach at high speed, shouting for Chris to show him the ferocity with which he had killed Sir Rhydon. Chris looked at his armor with a startled expression, which had a huge number of abrasions on it, and wondered why Perth had done so much damage to him, even the armor hadn't saved him. Lind gave Chris a startled look and wondered if this was the first time he'd seen Chris fight so fiercely. Alec watched the match with a smile and thought that they had expected nothing less from Perth, a true master who would be reliable at the right eight gates, no squire could hold a candle to him. Chris frowned and clenched his teeth. He leaped forward and reflected that no matter how hard he tried, it looked like there was no way to avoid losses. Chris used his technique to attack Perth, his spear flying at a high speed. Perth parried the blows with a smile as he asked that Chris had already recovered from the blow. Perth dodged a lot of Chris' attacks and said he was a tough guy. Suddenly Perth, looking ahead, became thoughtful. He looked at Chris, who was swinging a lunge forward, and wondered if he had opened up and was going to attack. Perth lunged forward with his sword, but Chris caught Perth's left arm with his spear. Perth jumped away from Chris. Blood spurted from Perth's hand, and he looked at Chris with a puzzled expression and said he was braver than he looked. Chris glared at Pert and thought that in just a moment he knew where he was going to hit and reacted immediately. Looking at Pert's hand, Chris thought that he was able to injure him, but due to the healing power obtained at the second level of Weiss proficiency, the wound is insignificant. Chris, looking fearfully ahead, reflected that such inaccurate punches were useless against him. Chris rushed forward at high speed, his movements difficult to follow. Perth, glaring at him, wondered if this was the same technique he had used in the fight with Sir Raiden. Chris began to deal a huge number of blows to the enemy without sparing any effort. Pert, glaring at Chris, shouted that he thought such tricks would work for him. Chris didn't say anything as he continued to attack. The sheer number of punches that Perth could easily parry, Chris reflected that he knew that no, he couldn't beat Perth with this dance. Chris swung his spear, and then wondered what he could probably use to destroy it. Perth's sword was able to graze Chris, and began to slice through his torso. Chris desperately shouted loudly. Then, with all his strength, he struck at Perth's sword, breaking it. Alec looked at the fight in fright and shouted no. Perth stared dumbfounded in front of him as he pondered that his movement had changed. Chris recalled a conversation with Taquilla asking him how to defeat Wiser, which yes, Taquilla probably knew. Taquil, looking at his daughter, who was training on a dummy, said that it was not worth trying to defeat him, but if you run a blade through Wiser or an ordinary person, they will obviously die. Taquil, looking menacingly ahead, told Chris not to try to defeat them, but simply kill them. It was the only way to survive the battle against Wiser. Chris used the death dance technique. His spear was painted with a red line, and he lunged towards Perth, the rhythm of a funeral march. Suddenly, Chris had seen enough of Perth knocking the spear out of his hands with his broken weapon. Pert tossed aside Chris's spear and his broken sword. Chris, looking at it, thought it was a good idea. Perth punched Chris in the stomach again with great force, and Chris wondered what to do. He clenched his jaw and ran at Perth, thinking that once the funeral march started, he wouldn't be able to stop. Chris slammed his fist down on the puzzled Perth. Perth's hand flew out of the way, and Chris realized that it was now open to the left. Chris ran up to him and kicked him in the stomach. Then Pert watched, startled, as Chris drew the second blade from his belt. Chris' blade glowed, and he wondered if it was a batajutsu technique. His glittering blade was flying up from below, straight at Pert, and Chris wondered if it was piercing beams of light. Digo and Doki looked ahead, startled. Alec and the soldier couldn't contain their surprise either. Suddenly, someone with a mustache wanted to say something. It was Strick, Chris shouted happily along with the soldiers. Chris was standing across from Perth. The latter, lying on the ground and holding his stomach, asked what this technique was called. Chris sternly replied that they were piercing beams of light. Suddenly, blood spurted from Perth's chest and he said it was unbelievable. He fell to the ground as Alec ran toward him. Strick gritted his teeth and shouted that he was a freak. The cavalry came out of the castle, Strick shouted that they should attack with all their strength, they must protect the hero of the fortress wall. Chris looked at Alec and yelled at him to stop, where was he going, and a puzzled Alec yelled at Chris to let him take Perth. Chris furrowed his brows and shouted that he dared to defame their duel. Alec dropped to his knees and shouted that he was begging. He, kneeling near the body of Perth, said that Perth should lead the next generation, he asks to be allowed to take it. Chris Groves pointed a finger at them, then shouted that it was cowardly, he couldn't believe that a commander who had put his own family's honor on the line was now on his knees in front of his enemy. Alec's brow furrowed but he didn't say anything, Chris kept shouting that it was just because of one soldier, he was definitely from the wolves family that he knew about. Alec gritted his teeth, then he grabbed Pert, and Chris told them to remember what happened today. Chris had his team running to him, 
asking how he was doing. Digo came up to Chris and asked if he was alright. He was bleeding. Chris said with a smile that he shouldn't make a big deal out of it. It was just a scratch. Chris thought that, in fact, his rib had shifted. Cavalry ran up to Chris. One of the soldiers shouted, Okay or Chris? Chris turned around and laughed and said that well, here's the pandemonium. Suddenly, Chris, not turned around with Lind. Ahead and with the cavalry, Slithy ran. Slithy was advancing on the enemy army with the cavalry, and the enemy soldiers shouted that Sapporo was coming from the opposite direction. The enemy soldiers turned around and shouted what's going on. The enemy is on both sides, is this really a trap? Alec glared at Chris. Lind shouted in fright, what the hell are you going to do if they attack wolves? I don't know the whole situation, and everything goes down the drain. Chris shouted loudly and menacingly that the troops were coming. Slithy, along with Sephora A, Na, looked at Chris, and Chris shouted attention. He glanced at Alec, who was holding Perth in his arms, and shouted that the wolves' knights should be escorted out with respect. Slithy shouted for everyone to stop, and Chris shouted that they had fought bravely. He kept shouting that in a fierce battle, they were defending their honor. Alec looked at Chris in surprise. All the commanders returned to their soldiers. Alec said as he left that the wolves would defend their honor. Chris smiled at them. Digo closes his eyes and looks at Chris. He asks him, Sir, what are they doing now? Chris looks ahead, then sees a lot of enemy troops running straight at them. He thinks that the troops will definitely follow on the battlefield, so we should go after them. However, his injury is more serious than he thought, and will he be able to hold on? After that, his leg starts to run out of mana. He looks at his leg and the way it's absorbing mana, thinking that energy is coming out of the seal. After that, Chris brings his hand to his torso until it glows green. He thinks about how he feels, how early he heals. After that, a system window appears above it, indicating that the level of Whis proficiency has increased to 31. Chris smiles, thinking of Wise's stage 2. The healing power has become more powerful. Chris watches Lin Digo and Doki walk up to them, smiling, and Chris tells them they have to go back to the battlefield right now, and do they have any objections? And Digo says that there are no objections. After that, Chris shouts to everyone to gather all the cavalrymen and leave, keeping the formation. After that, the head of the camp comes up to them and asks in surprise, looking at Chris, is he overdoing it? Chris looks at him as he continues to talk about how the fortress wall is still intact, so you can wait a little while until you recover. And Chris tells him, while the boss listens very surprised, that the war is not over yet and there is no rest. And Chris sitting on a horse with a red mane smiles, looking at the boss, they say that the fortress wall is not the only thing they need to protect. The Count runs straight ahead on his horse, looking ahead. He runs through many enemy troops, attacking them, cutting it into pieces. They scream in pain. And the Count stops, picks up his weapon, and notices that it's broken. After that, he notices how many enemy troops are running at him and shouting that he is a crazy old man. The Count draws his weapon. He manages to cut off the heads of two soldiers who manage to run up to him. They cry out in pain, after which the Count looks around and shouts that Ludwig's squad must defeat the enemy. And then the Count starts coughing up blood. He wonders about it. At this point, one of the arrows flies up to him, while he regains consciousness. And Gillen, who managed to run up, cuts this arrow. Then the Count rubs his hand over the blood on his face and calls Gillen to him. Gillen, in turn, looks around and shouts that he should not overexert himself. And then they shout that there are enemies from the rear. Gillen and the Count are looking in this direction. They notice how one of the soldiers points his finger in the direction from which a huge number of enemy troops are coming. He shouts that Walsh's troops are coming, and Gillen, who is next to the Count, looks at him and says that he will have to leave. And after Gillen leaves, the Count looks the other way and tells him to take care of himself. Gillen starts walking away without a word, and he slows down a bit and says that he will do everything in his power. After that, the Count looks in the other direction, making a serious face, and he notices one of the army commanders with a scar on his face. He says that at last the Count is alone. After which, the Count lowers his eyes and listens as he says that it's a pity he can't believe that the hero of the fortress wall and Count Ludwig has become so infirm. A commander with a huge scar on his face, sitting on a horse, says that today he will end his life with his own hands. The Count starts to get very mixed up with this, his eyes start to shine, and he says that he is no match for him as a sucker. After which, this commander starts to smile as he looks at the Count. One of the soldiers watches the battle as a large number of allied troops begin to kill the enemy troops sitting on horses. They cry out in pain, and he thinks to himself, holding in his hands that there are still new soldiers here. One of the soldiers clenched his teeth and clearly in pain asks for mercy while they stick a weapon in him. And one of the commanders looks around while a huge pile of clouds of smoke. He shouts for everyone to go back and not break the formation. While this guy with gray hair and a shield is defending himself from one of the enemy soldiers. To block the attack, he strikes directly at the enemy's neck, and the enemy screams in pain. 
and then the commander turns to him and shouts for the knights. After that, one of the enemy troops brings a spear to him and kills him, shouting for him to die. This gray-haired soldier was watching all of this, and he's watching it and shouting at the commander, clearly scared. He doesn't notice anything as his leg starts to bleed, splattering on his face. He starts to turn around and sees one of the soldiers lying on the floor, plunging his blade right into the leg of this soldier. After that, he gets angry and stabs the fallen soldier right in the neck, calling him a soldier. He screams in pain and bleeds to death, and then this soldier kneels down next to this bleeding corpse. He lowers the gun, panting, thinking to himself, God. He sees one of the enemy troops running towards him, holding a spear, thinking about what it means his time has come. Then he folds his arms and raises his head, while someone on a horse runs past him. It was Chris, who strikes with a running soldier, cutting off his head, and it flies away with his spear, leaving a huge amount of blood. This soldier watches this while blood is splattered everywhere and thinks. He notices that reinforcements have arrived, and Digo uses his axe to take down many enemy soldiers in one blow. And this soldier watching this, thinking that the Allied Cavalry Squad he notices Doki using his axes, slicing through a lot of enemy heads, wondering what they're doing here. And he looks at it in surprise, wondering what it all means. After which, he watches Lind. I got off my horse right next to this soldier. He approaches him and tells him to finally wake up. Lind walks up to him and looks at him, asking him his name. And he replies that he is a Saxon. And Lind tells him not to give up. While he looks surprised, he says that it's too early to stay alive again. After which, he notices Lin sitting next to him, telling them about their sun is sure to rise. So far, they have a lot of cavalrymen, and the sun appears among the clouds. Chris runs on and thinks seriously to himself that just a little more and we need to go faster. He notices how about a lot of enemy and allied troops are fighting among each other, killing, and the way the Count fights alongside their general. He notices the Count and thinks about him, which is thank God he managed, starting to smile. Chris then notices that his horse has been hit by an arrow. Iken falls to the ground, and Chris manages to jump off him. He looks around and sees someone being impaled and blood pouring everywhere. I was very scared, surprised by this watching. He notices a lot of blood coming out of the graph as the general dominates him. And Chris screams that no, don't. The count screams in pain as blood flows everywhere. The general smiles, too, all wounded. The general then stabs the count, who is pushed back, and his sword falls behind him, sticking into the ground. The general screams as he looks at the Count and manages to stick his weapon right in the Count's stomach. I smile, hugging the Count to me. The Count runs in, yelling over and the general tells him it's all over. The Count whispers in his ear that he's a cheeky puppy. What makes him think it's still over and then he punches the general right in the face with his fist. After that, the Count sits down on one knee, breathing heavily. For now, the general is standing in shock holding his weapon and pulling his head to the side, spraying out a lot of blood. Fierce battles are taking place around them. And the general, looking at the tired, blood-soaked count, tells him that even if they are enemies. The general looks surprised and says that he expresses the deepest respect for your tenacity with an unbending will regarding the fortress wall. There's no way he'll forget it. After that, he approaches the count while he is bending down, and raises her sword right above him. They say that now he can rest in peace. And then the general notices a black thing flying. She flies right between the general's face, and he looks at her in surprise. It starts emitting purple smoke and the general is very surprised by this. All around is purple smoke and the general covers himself with his hands so as not to breathe it. He looks around and sees Chris flying from above him with his spear and shining golden eyes. The general notices this, after which he sees Chris running out of the smoke, and he thinks it's the black smoke devil. The general tries to dodge Chris' punch as he lands a massive amount of blows with his spear, scattering all the smoke. He breaks his weapon and hits it. The general falls to the ground, screaming in pain. Then he sees Chris flying down on top of him with his spear. He wonders what he's doing here, and Chris plunges his spear right into the general's heart. It begins to dissipate, and Graf emerges from it, watching as Chris plunges his spear right into the general. After Chris kills him, he turns to the Count, shouting at him. He goes up to him and calls the Count to him, looking at how bad he is. The Count closes his eyes and begins to laugh. They say that it's funny why at such a moment it wasn't his one son or Gillen who was next to him. That's him while Chris grabs it and stares at it. Chris smiles and says it's okay. They look at the battlefield and how the allied army fights the enemy, killing each other. And the Count asks, for what? For the sake of protecting the fortress wall, to protect all their lives, and today he will replace it. He opens his eyes and says that he owes him now. Skips his head and says he can pay back later. Count B, on the verge of death, looks at him. Then Chris puts it on the ground. He puts his weapon down beside him and looks down at the dying Count. After that, the enemy army runs up to Chris, shouting that Mr. General died. They're shouting that it's all because of Chris, that he needs to be killed. 
They run straight at him, shouting and saying in anger that they will not take the Count's head, and one of them notices Chris appear in front of him and abruptly disappear. He wonders about it, and Chris slams his fist right into that soldier. Immediately, Chris takes the blade in his hands, his face serious. After that, he strikes once on the neck, cutting off his head, and then two enemy soldiers attack him, poking him with their spear, but Chris manages to dodge the blow, after which, he makes a dash for this soldier and cuts off his head while he screams in pain and bleeds to death. He falls to the ground with a weapon stuck in his neck, and Chris is confronted by a lot of other enemy soldiers, and he picks up a spear and shouts at them to listen to the Eight Families' war plan. By order of Count Ludwig, this place is now under the protection of Squire Chrisu. After that, Chris draws a line on the floor with his spear, saying that those who are tired of living can cross it, and a lot of enemy soldiers are running at him, shouting that he is all alone and needs to be killed. The current one looks at them with a serious face, after which he runs straight at them. They are instantly killed by two of them, while many of them do not even understand what is happening. They turn around and notice that two soldiers are already lying down. He lies there, killing them one by one, cutting off their hands and bodies. While they are screaming in pain, he runs forward and cuts off many of their heads. After that, these soldiers start to panic and shout for reinforcements and help to come. But Chris looks at them and continues to stab with his spear, cutting off head after head. After that, he throws his spear to one of the soldiers who tried to escape. It hits him squarely in the back, and he falls, screaming in pain. Chris gets a little tired and lifts up, sighing, while there are many corpses lying around it. And then he sees someone shouting and turns around. He notices a huge soldier in grey armor with a huge weapon, which causes a huge crash and a pile of dust with its blow. It was a giant soldier with a head said to be the Knight Pedro. Chris spots him, leaning down a little as he spins his chain-linked weapon. He throws Chris's chain and wraps it around his arm as Chris looks on in surprise. He shouts that he will avenge the general. Then Chris looks at him with a serious face and, straining his hand, pushes the chain back. Pedro gets a shock watching this and runs at him. Chris then clenches his chain-bound hand into a fist and attacks, shouting. After which, he manages to land a punch on his stomach, and he screams in pain. He falls to the ground, leaving a dent in his armor from Chris' kick. He breathes heavily with his head lowered, after which he raises it and asks for forgiveness. He says no, and at that moment, Chris hits him with his fist wrapped in a mace, and Chris remains his spear, saying that he will repeat those who want revenge must attack, and the many enemy soldiers surrounding him stopped. Chris takes his hands, weapons, he goes and says he wants glory. Let them attack. Clearly angry, he starts shouting, saying that he will crush every single one of them. One of the soldiers is hit with a mace. It hits him squarely on the head, and he's bleeding everywhere as he screams in pain. Chris turns around and a lot of enemy soldiers appear around him, surrounding him. They run straight at him and kill one by one they scream in pain. And then a lot of arrows are flying at Chris. He notices them or cuts them into small pieces. Then Chris grits his teeth and looks away. He notices these two archers standing behind the two knights. These knights are clearly angry and run at Chris. Chris then runs straight at them and hits one of them with a mace, breaking his helmet. And while he's screaming in pain, bleeding profusely, Chris stands right on top of him. The enemy soldiers look at him as he stands on one of them. Chris then picks up the mace and throws it. It hits one of the archers squarely in the face, while the other stands there in shock and watches. Then Chris gets down on one knee and from behind him, the enemy soldiers are clenching their teeth and shouting for him to die while attacking him. And Chris gets up a little and attacks them with his spear, cutting off one of their heads and two of their torsos. Having runs forward from such a spear, cutting off the head of one of the soldiers, after which she flies forward right after Chris. Apparently, the man on the horse is shooting arrows, while one of the soldiers turns to him and says that they are done. Lind pulls an arrow from her quiver, and he says great, then they should join Chris. Then one of the allied soldiers shouts to the man on the horse, that the second in command has an urgent message, and he turns to him and asks what is it. He says that the count died on the battlefield, and the deputy commander was very surprised by this, being afraid, asking how so. He thinks to himself, clearly worried that the Count is dead, and in that case, what chance do they have of winning? He listens to this soldier, turning to him, while he tells him that, however, thanks to the help of the Allied cavalrymen, they are gradually driving off the enemy army, and the deputy commander is surprised to say that they still have cavalrymen left, and this is a squad of colorist scouts, and he looks at Chris' squad with Lind, Dig, and the dog walking forward and says no. This squad is led by Squire Chris. On sitting on a horse and shooting sound shouts Chris, who attacks one of the soldiers with her fist. They say that Chris he figured out, the rest is left only to survive. After that, the guy sitting on a horse cuts off many bodies of enemy soldiers with his weapon, until not everyone flies off and screams in pain. Doki is also not far behind and cuts off many of their hands with a blow of his axe. Lind, in turn, shoots arrows, hits many enemy soldiers right in the head, killing them with one shot. 
and Chris runs forward, using his spear, he cuts these soldiers to pieces until there is blood everywhere. And the second in command looks at all this and thinks with surprise that those guys he's watching are a squad of cavalrymen and how they go forward led by Chris and kill a lot of enemy soldiers. Thinks they're their new hope. The enemy commander sits on his horse while the knight beside him shouts to him that the enemy commander is too strong. They look worried, and then he looks at the gray-haired commander. He sits on a horse with his eyes closed. He asks him what they should do now, clearly worried and worried. After which, the man is clearly angry and grits his teeth, looking ahead. He tells everyone to retreat, and all families are defeated. After that, Chris watches the enemy army turn around and leave while huge clouds of dust rise up everywhere. Chris is breathing heavily and receives system notifications telling him that the required amount of experience points has been accumulated. Lynn smiles as she walks up to Chris and asks him, is this really the end, did they win? Chris looking ahead says that yes, it's finally over. After that, a lot of allied troops rejoice and raise their hands up, shouting that the enemy is retreating. They shout everything that they have improved, and very happy, they say that they have won. Chris is watching it all. He sees one of the deputy commanders approach the Count's body with Gillen. They cry and call him to them. Gillen looks at Chris, clearly tired and angry. After which, many soldiers, along with Chris, lower their heads and start crying. They look at the Count's pipes as he lies covered in blood. After which, many people gathered at the huge altar while the priest says that he devoted his whole life to protecting these lands. And the next day, Count Ludwig's funeral was held. His one son, along with Gillen and one of the women, stand in black clothes and watch everything that happens. His one son is crying, clenching his teeth and biting his lips. And Chris standing near Linda and Digo with black ribbons say that civilians were banned from drinking alcohol for three days. And the soldiers had to wear a black ribbon on their shoulders as a sign of mourning for the departed hero. Three days later, one of the men with a black mustache reads a note saying that the eldest son of Count Vahane is Ludwig saying that his eldest son, smiling and dressed in beautiful clothes, is the heir and has taken the place of the count. The eldest son then slams his fist down on the chair. He is clearly angry and says that really they haven't found it yet. They tell him no, and a lot of people sitting around the count. They smile and look at him and say what is the reason. Why achievement points are worth discussing doesn't show up. One of the men nearby says in surprise that he heard that this guy alone killed hundreds of soldiers, and together with his squad, the four of them drove off 2,000 opponents. They also say that he is the youngest wiser, and how does he want to see it? Then the Count turns and shouts for Chris to be found quickly. He lowers his eyes and thinks that he must make him his subordinate by all means, and even if he puts him in an inconspicuous position, he will be able to significantly raise the status of both his family and the entire city. He can't pass up this chance. After that, in the tavern while Digo eats chicken, and Elia listens to the stories of Lind, who stands on a chair and pulls an imaginary bow. He says that at that moment, while standing on the hill, he fired an arrow, and it caught up with the enemy in an instant. Ellie asks him what he should believe. After that, they all sit together at the table and hear a man come who says that he was summoned on the orders of Count Ludwig. This soldier is standing at the entrance with a black mustache, saying that the squire's squad members should immediately give out information about the location of their commander. Digo then eats the chicken, and Lynn talks about how it's another one, looking at it, while Ellis points his fingers and says that he's really deaf and turns away from it when you eat, Digo, you're a pig. And while Ellis elbows Lind and points at Digo, Lind tells them how many times they tell them they don't know where he is, just like everyone else, and they themselves wonder where he is hanging around. After that, this soldier points his finger at the paper and begins to get angry, saying whether he is joking, because he was given a strict order. Lind looks on in surprise as Digo gets up from the table, and that soldier continues to count that in case of insubordination to him. Lind tells him that it's going to be hard today, after which Doki throws his axe at him and hits a piece of wood next to him. And this soldier keeps saying that everyone will be arrested while this axe is flying. He looks at this axe and starts to worry. After that, Alina sitting in the back smiles, looking at the dog that threw the axe. She says that mom is our relatives, we apologize this guy is not friends with alcohol. And Doki gets mad because they say he's too noisy. He is clearly drunk, takes another axe and says he has another one. Then it hiccups. This soldier screams, clearly scared, while Ellis and the dog watch on. And she is surprised, says that Doki and you are cool. She turns to Linda, who is sipping from a mug, and says how impossible it is that she doesn't know where Chris is. To which Len says yes he told them to just wait. Then he lifts his head up and says he's pretty good. Chris also added that he went to meet a beautiful woman. Then in the underground prison it is Daybetta. One of the soldiers is standing at the iron gate. And a man wearing a black cape is walking down a dark corridor. He puts some gold coins in the hands of this soldier. After that, this soldier says that only for a little while, and this man says that he understood. And a girl lying on the floor with blonde hair and says that she is not receiving guests, 
and he should leave. After that, this man in a raincoat approaches the prison cell. While she stares at the wall from the shadows, he tells her why she let herself be caught that day, and he is sure that she would have escaped quite easily. This girl with blonde hair and brown eyes turns to him and talks in surprise about who he is, and this hooded man pulls down his hood. She tries to look around, who is he? It turns out to be Chris, looking at her through the bars. 